there's still this widespread consensus that the euro area is going to outperform the US. And cyclically, that doesn't seem to add up. The US consumer still remains extremely resilient. I think the deflationary forces are still out there. If I think of the risk to inflation, it's not to the downside, it's to the upside. In order for the global economy to be doing well, all the boats have got to be moving in the same direction. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. China is determined to make August interesting. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Roberts, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500, slightly negative this morning. Fantastic lineup looking ahead. Retail sales just around the corner. Earnings from Home Depot dropping across the Bloomberg. Tomorrow, numbers from Target. Results from Walmart on Thursday. But once again this morning, we have to begin in China. Rate cuts, Bramo, and the data not great at all. The biggest rate cuts going back to 2020, the data coming weaker across the board, whether it has to do with retail sales, whether it has to do with industrial production, they scrapped their youth unemployment metric, which is not exactly encouraging. And now the question is, are they preparing a big enough stimulus to really stave off weakness that is much deeper than people expected? This is the right signal. The big question, you've alluded to it. What's next? Here's the commentary this morning from Standard Chartered. The cut has been aggressive from SockGen. This is unlikely to be the last measure. So Lisa, that tees up the question. What's next? Although Citigroup uh, analysts have come out out and said they are not seeing any real policy reforms that could avoid some sort of Japanification of China, some slowdown, dramatic slowdown in growth. And honestly, that's a lot of the commentary that I've been reading this morning. This is no bazooka. It's clear that they haven't really prepared something more comprehensive. So where is the appetite to do something that could really salvage the economy from really uh, de decelerating massively? You mentioned youth unemployment. Would you like the official reason for that? <laughs> it's ridiculous. The National Bureau of Statistics over in China. They said the labor statistics need, quote, further optimization and more research needs to be done on, quote, whether students looking for a job before graduation should be counted in the labor statistics. So no youth unemployment statistic, but we know what kind of level that was at. It was pretty elevated. It was incredibly elevated, I believe north of 20 percent at one point. And for them to say, OK, we need to reassess exactly how we're going to massage the numbers to basically display them in a better way gives nobody confidence and frankly probably has a counterproductive uh, type of result that said what it highlights is they are losing control of the message they're trying to say look this needs to be something that isn't viewed as negative well suddenly people are reassessing much deeper weakness the china's one story the other for story for us this morning is on the u.s consumer numbers from home depot just dropping across the bloomberg i'll give you a sneak peek of some of those numbers second quarter comp sales just less bad, less bad than expected, down by 2%. The estimate negative 4.1%. And in the mix as well here, Lisa, a $15 billion buyback too. We're up here by 0.6%. And we've seen this across the board, that even if someone, uh, it, even if a company is showing a bit of a deceleration, they deliver a buyback, some sort of shareholder-friendly action. The share's up a little bit, not great. That said, Home Depot, separate story from the rest of the earnings that we're expecting to get, whether it's Target tomorrow or Walmart on Thursday, as you mentioned, because that's really really less about the housing market, which is really a big question mark, and more about what the retailer is doing when they go to the store. So I think that the, the housing side, the Home Depot, the home repair is kind of a separate story in some Consumers ways. Consumers held up so well yeah. over the last year, Lisa. Last year was all about pricing power, increasing prices, inflation. Has that changed? Some commentary from the CEO over at Home Depot, continued pressure in big ticket categories. Can we read too much into that? This is the same story that we've been seeing. People brought forward all of their purchases of washing machines and dishwashers during the pandemic, and now all of a sudden uh, they have a greater number than they have to sell. I'm just wondering whether in about two hours' time, two and a half hours' time, we're just going to be talking about Amazon's Prime Day and basically how to distill. Crushed it. I, I mean, <laughs> this, to me, it's Amazon's world. We're living in it. I mean, that's basically what we're going to be talking about in uh, you know two and a half hours. That's been the last decade, hasn't it? Retail sales <laughs> just around the corner. Home Depot results behind us in front of us target tomorrow then on to Walmart on Thursday it's the price action for you we pull back on the S&P 500 down by 0.5 percent yields are higher on a 10-year by three basis points this wasn't even on our radar this morning because there's so much going on but it should be the dominant story of the last week or so in fact Lisa I'd say the last month we're through 420 on a 10-year this to me again I'm so glad you said that not only are 10-year yields at the highest level of the year but real yields did you see this real yields inflation adjusted 
10-year yields at the highest levels going back to 2009, which raises a question of at what point the pressure on equities really starts to gain steam in a material way. When does this start to bite in the economy and does the Fed have to back away? Now we're seeing some restriction. And that, I think, is the story that we've been hearing on the margins, that suddenly now things are getting restrictive. 8.30 a.m., U.S. retail sales come out. As we've been mentioning, we also get Empire Manufacturing, which could be interesting because it's the first read on August manufacturing that people look at. We are seeing Home Depot as the first of the earners on the retail sector ahead of Target and Walmart. Again, how distorted are some of the retailers that are tied to the housing market? At 10 a.m., we get the latest read on the housing market, NAHB Housing Market Index, with home builder sentiment coming out at a time where 30-year mortgage rates, 7.5%, <laughs> the highest going back more than a decade. And you have to wonder how long people can keep buying homes at a time when it is prohibitively expensive to do so. And I understand that home builders feel good because there are no other homes available for sale. But at what point does this actually bite? Can you imagine... You take out that mortgage, you buy a house for almost exactly the same price the guy next door bought it for, and your mortgage is 7.5% and the guy next door is at like 3 The reality of this, and I've actually done the calculations, not because, you know, I sure. was trying to have a shot in front or anything, but, but my point was that, you know, you can see a material like $4,000 difference, oh, yeah. $3,000 difference They're driving a month. like a nice, tidy Mercedes and you're sitting there just struggling to get around on a bike. What's it called again? Brutal. Interest rate? Interest Mortgage rate? envy. Mortgage envy. At 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari is also speaking. So hopefully we'll uh, get some sense of where So much thinking. mortgage envy. We blame him for keeping rates so low <laughs> for so long. Well, now he's a super hawk. Yeah, so he's right. trying to make up for it, you know? Sure. He's the reason rates are so high for so long <laughs> and so low. For so, it's all Kashkari's fault. <laughs> Joanne well, Feeney joins us know. now, portfolio manager and partner at Advisors Capital Management. Joanne, two stories for us this morning. China's one, the U.S. consumer's another. Let's start with the U.S. consumer. Are you expecting to see further signs of resilience in numbers from Home Depot this morning, already out, Target later this week, Walmart after that? Yeah, it's no mystery, John, that the consumer is strong. Uh, you know, you look at the data on real disposable income, and you see it's actually been rising for the last several months. That is adjusted for inflation, and it's because there are more people employed. It's because wages have kept growing while inflation has slowed down. And so there's more money in, in household pockets and real purchasing power. And that's why we're continuing to see pretty strong numbers. You know, clearly retail sales growth has slowed dramatically. Uh, and, you know, it's likely to continue to slow. It's it's just barely above uh, zero in terms of year over year growth. But, you know, that tells us something about how the consumers, you know, are likely to proceed through the rest of this period of, of the adjustment to the high inflation that we're seeing you know, out of the Fed. Even with high interest rates, you guys just been talking about, even with high mortgage rates, the housing market remains strong. It's somewhere we've been investing for for a while, we think it's going to continue to be strong for, for, for years to come, given the shortages that are out there. So, Joanne, would you expect this three-month rolling recession forecast just to get keep pushed out, just get pushed out every single month? Yeah, we keep doing it ourselves, obviously, in, in our forecast. And we've always, though, looked at the resilience of the consumer as the reason why it's going to continue to get pushed out, unless something dramatic breaks. Uh, like, you know, commercial real estate having a contagion effect as that, you know, continues to face low uh, occupancy and, and high interest rates and restructuring. You know, unless something breaks that strength in the consumer, their continued uh, strength in, in the real income that they have to work with really does sustain this U.S. economy for quite a while. Now, China could be a problem. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is China seeing a real slowdown in growth, something breaking? Uh, it's it's not as dramatic, I, I think. It's not dramatic enough, Lisa, uh, for it to break the U.S. economy. You know, clearly, it's important for some sectors, and that's why you know, want to be really judicious about where you invest. Materials, for example, is going to suffer more with China slowing down. We're seeing the China consumer also, like in the U.S., switch to, to travel and leisure, switch to services and away from goods. We're also seeing the, the governments, local and you know federal level, in China struggling with their budgets now, having overspent earlier. And so really pulling back on some of the infrastructure investments, the real estate problem there, much more severe than here. So it's really where in the economy uh, are the vulnerabilities and, and how that you know needs to guide investments at this point. There also is a question about the role of, of China on inflation and if China's slowdown actually exacerbates some of the inflation problems or prolongs them. I think it's notable that even during a time of concern around China's growth, you're seeing a continued sell-off in treasuries. What is the signal from that? 
Yeah, I, I think the sell-off in treasuries uh, has a couple of other drivers as opposed to China. I think it's one, the treasury needing to restock its coffers uh, after, you know, the, the political debacle uh, of raising the debt ceiling. And it's also the recognition, finally, uh, in the market that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer in order for the Fed really to nail reduction in inflation down to that 2% target. The tail of that goal is, I think, going to be a long one. I think the market's finally coming to realize that. It's amazing to me how few people have actually changed their opinion on the Treasury market. Bramo, this from Steve Major of HSBC on the sell-off recently. And just to be clear for our audience at home, Steve Major is a bond bull. This is the quote. <laughs> Ten-year yields are at the top of the range, propelled there this time by a narrative that includes a surge in bond supply, a credit downgrade, and the tweet to the BOJ's YCC. None of this shakes our bullish conviction. What would shake the conviction around this bond market? There are so few people out there who believe we can sustain life above 4% for that long. And he's not alone, right? We've seen this from JP Morgan. We've seen this from Western Asset Management saying the exact same thing. It's a great question. And how much is that baked into a market? And then who's on the other side? Who's pushing against them? Who's causing yields to rise to the highest levels in decades? I mean, that really is one of the questions. Joanne, can we sustain life above 4% on a US 10 year? Why is that proven so difficult to do? Well, you know, people, I think, are recognizing a little bit of a new reality. We've been here before. Right. We've seen higher real interest rates in the past, just not in the past you know, 20 years. So what is it about this reality that could cause interest rates to remain above 4 percent of the 10 year you know, horizon? And it could just be simply higher government deficits, not just in the U.S., but around the world in the wake of the cost it took to get through the pandemic. All of the government outlays, right, drove up uh, government spending. And now in the U.S., for example, the, the need for rebuilding our infrastructure Right, which had been neglected for decades. So these pressures on, on the government budget, plus all those entitlement programs with an aging population. So higher deficits could lead to higher real interest rates persistently. And they, even then you layer on a 2% inflation, once we get back there, you still have you know the tenure at three and a half, four percent 4%. So we're gonna have to live with that. Joanne, uh, the Bank of America fund manager research uh, just came out, and it shows that people are the least bearish going back to February of 2022, with cash allocations plunging from 5.3% to 4.8%. Are you in that bucket? Have you actually deployed cash and said, you know what, this is the new normal, and the economy is sustaining it. Let's go into home builders. Let's go into other sectors that you like and get out of cash. Well, we've generally been full, mostly fully invested. If we have a little bit of cash, it's because we want to be, be able to be opportunistic. In terms of the mix of equities and fix, which I think is more generally your question, uh, we haven't changed our allocation here. We do think, though, for certain clients, certain types of clients, we've been able to take advantage of those high interest rates on the fixed income side to really sort of shore up the stability of their portfolios. And, and yeah, at least, I mean, the market multiple is telling you that investors have become in some sense more optimistic and perhaps because you know a little bit of a fear of missing out as the as the market has gone up so much over the last several months but at this point in time we do see the market is you know, certainly trading above its historical average at you know 20 times we think at this point you have to be very selective there are still opportunities out there there are still really attractive stocks trading below 15 times uh, that you can add to client portfolios to generate income perhaps to act as a buffer. If the market pulls back, at least you get that dividend income. So we think it's a time to be very careful about where to go. And that's why we tend to be a little bit more value tilted, particularly for clients that are sort of living on their portfolios in retirement. Hey, Joanne, thank you. Joanne Finney there of Advisors Capital Management. Quite a day so far. Let's recap Home Depot just quickly. That stock is barely positive in the pre-market by 0.2%. Remember, back in May, they cut their guidance. So they've beaten a pretty low bar this morning. Lisa, here's the quote from the CEO. While there was strength in categories associated with smaller projects, we did see continued pressure in certain big-ticket discretionary categories. How much is this just the supply and demand? They boosted supply in response to the pandemic, and now demand following off just a little bit. Home Depot pretty much unchanged. The latest on China coming up next from New York City. Good morning. We don't want to be enemies. We can be friends. And uh, we love to see China can enjoy democracy and freedom just like us, as long as there is parity and dignity. 
Our door is always open. We are willing to cooperate with China. Lai Ching Da there, the Vice President of Taiwan, speaking with tensions with the mainland China in a series of exclusive interviews with Bloomberg Business Week. More on that a little bit later. We need to talk about the economic data out of China. Dreadful. The response to it so far? Incremental. Overnight, China's central bank unexpectedly reduced the key interest rate by the most since 2020. The scores off the back of it look like this. Stateside, equity still negative on the S&P 500. We're down by about 0.5 percent. Necession lows. In the bond market, Market, the Treasury sell-off continues. At least the yields are higher by four basis points. It's 4.23 on a 10-year. This is a new high for 2023 and getting closer to the cycle high through 4.30. That was back in October. It's important to me that you're seeing bonds sell off at a time of risk aversion and it's global risk aversion. And what does this mean about the response function, the 60-40 kind of inverse relationship of bonds and stocks at a time where people are concerned about a slowdown in growth? It means people are still worried about inflation and bonds are not the haven right now that they have been traditionally. This decision came right before the data, so no surprise the data was terrible. Correct. The National Bureau of Statistics said domestic demand remains insufficient. The economy's recovery foundation still needs to be strengthened. Can I just stress again, and we've done this repeatedly all year, this is not where we thought we were going to be at the start of the year. China was meant to be the bright spot of the global economy. Reopening. Remember the China trade, the reopening trade? It lasted about five minutes at the back end of last year. Here we are at the end of summer talking about rate cuts and a prospect of more stimulus. Well, the rub was that when it reopened, the economy was not in a form to surge back and that there are some structural problems that they're not addressing or not able to address in a way to keep growth at the high levels that people had previously expected. And it seems like there isn't the willingness to do that. And I think that's what people are saying with disappointing policy projections, just simply because there isn't something to deal with both leverage and also stimulate growth. Let's start the conversation on China this morning with Michael Hirschen, the head of China Research at 22V Research. Michael, wonderful to have you on a program with us. Let's just start with that rate cut, big by China's standards, was it big enough? Uh, I think no. Um, there's deflation in China, so real rates have gone up. This is uh, this rate cut was an effort, I think, to partially offset that. But um, I think we're going to need to see considerably more across different areas of policy for China in order to really give this recovery firm footing. We'll need to see more coming on fiscal, given an absence of demand coming from other parts of the economy. Uh, I think we'll need to see more measures to stabilize property, given the latest warning signs there. And we'll need to see more follow through on these initial efforts to boost longer term confidence for the private sector and for the foreign business community in China. Michael, we've had plenty of moments similar to this one over the last decade, and often People that come on this program will give China and the policymaker in China the benefit of the doubt. And that view has been proven to be the right one time and time again. They've got the levers to respond to it. They can sort things out in an orderly manner. Michael, do you sense in any way, shape or form that this moment is different? I think it's different just in the sense that there is such an accumulation of different uh, problems and challenges facing China's economy. It's not just one thing right now. You've got um, the continued fallout of a very deep, painful restructuring of the property sector that's going to continue for a long time and really deprives the economy of a critical uh, driver of demand. You've got um, the onset of uh, a lot of structural challenges, including, including demographics, which are going to slow the country's growth rate. And then you've got this interesting political overlay in terms of how secure the private sector is feeling in today's China. Um, and the backdrop of geopolitical tensions and decoupling, which I think is also um, undermining to some degree the confidence of the private sector in China. So it's really that um, confluence of pressures set aside, uh, set against a policy setting that remains quite conservative, where many people in China are making the case. I think it's a persuasive case that policy needs to be considerably bolder. Uh, at this point in time. Michael, I want to just build on the last point that you made about the decoupling. How much is that, not just simply from a confidence level, but from a business level of business and manufacturing moving out of mainland China behind some of the weakness that has been unexpected for a lot of analysts? 
It's hard to say. I think it is uh, It is a factor. Um, it is showing up. Um, I don't think that it is the key um, macro factor right now. I think for exports, really, the story more is slowing growth in the global economy uh, and the advanced economies. So I don't think decoupling is having a real bite yet at the export sector. But it's there, and I think it's, in some ways, the longer-term trend that is, uh, and the the prospect of further decoupling that is hitting at private sector confidence. And you see, it, you see it show up in fairly weak manufacturing investment in China. So I think it's the outlook that that is probably more of a concern at this point than the the present impact on the data. The other policies that you mentioned, are they in direct sort of uh, counterbalance to what Xi Jinping and his administration wants to do in terms of rebalancing the economy, having a new vision? Is it sort of the policy measures that he would have to take to, to spur growth would go against some of the theories that he's been espousing? I think that there is, that's a good point. I think that there is a fundamental tension between a lot of these policy goals. Um, I think the uh, the leadership would like to see a very uh, rapid transition out of what they consider old growth drivers like property into new growth drivers like electric vehicles uh, and advanced manufacturing. Um, but unless you have the set of policies there um, that would support uh, sources of demand, in particular consumption, it's really hard to see how this all fits together in terms of the demand that's necessary to keep growth coming, particularly with external demand, with exports sliding. So I think that is perhaps the biggest disconnect is where the sources of demand are going to come from right now. Then you've got also a lot of tensions between um, President Xi's political agenda, um, which is you know continued emphasis on, uh, on the, the, the dominant role of the party um, and a fairly assertive foreign policy and what that means in terms of the steps that are going to be necessary to reassure the private sector that they have a place in China's economy uh, and also that geopolitical tensions uh, are not going to derail this growth story. Michael, just a final word, if you can, never mind the geopolitics, let's talk about the social tensions domestically. Youth unemployment, just because you stop reporting it doesn't mean the problem goes away. Michael, what are they going to do to address it? Well, I think that they are taking um, steps, including having uh, local government officials uh, do their best to find opportunities for, uh, for, for college graduates and other youth. I think they're treating it mainly as a structural problem, which is not certainly not completely wrong. But I think it's, all, it's really a reflection also of just how weak demand is. This is not an economy that's running hot enough right now to create those jobs. And I think that's, that's a problem. And it's, it's, it's one that's going to take considerably more policy efforts in order to, to get that moving. President Biden would have loved that trick last year, wouldn't he? Just suspend CPI reports. We'll suspend them and then ask all of his uh, local officials to say, you know, go out there, find a job for your, you know, for your neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor. We need, and, to, you we know. need to optimize the CPI report. Yeah, that wouldn't fly. You're not going to see it for a while. No. Michael, thank you. Michael Hershen there of 22V on the latest data out of China. Youth unemployment is a big problem. It's a big, big problem. It doesn't go away just because you stop reporting it. Especially if you're trying to build up a whole team of people who can really compete on a global level when it comes to technology, when it comes to artificial intelligence. It becomes a real problem if you don't feel like you've got that mobility in the nation. So again, this goes to the sort of contradiction within some of the goals. How do you move away from the old into the new without the jobs to support the young people who want to have some sort of ambition? Well, that's the latest on China. Here's the latest on the market. Equity session lows on the S&P 500 breaking down just a little bit more. On the S&P, we're negative by 0.6%. In the bond market, the sell-off continues at the long end. The 10-year is higher by four basis points, 4.23 on a 10-year. And the dollar has been a whole lot stronger recently, a bit weaker against the euro this morning at 109.38, but certainly going against the grain, Lisa, in the FX market. And what this has to do with is people expecting that rate cuts might not happen next year as quickly as they previously thought. Jordan Rochester has changed his call on the euro. Jordan Rochester Chester of Namora on the foreign exchange market joining us next from New York. This is Bloomberg.
your equity market, session lows, early days I know on the S&P 500, your sneak peek of things right now, we're negative 0.6% on the S&P, yesterday, best day of the month so far on the Nasdaq, snapping back lower by 0.65% this morning, plenty of earnings out there, Home Depot, okay, nothing too bad there, a beat, a beat of a very low bar, the stock is positive by about 0.3%, a buyback in the mix as well, still some challenges out there for big ticket items, we'll hear from Target tomorrow and Walmart on Thursday, if you switch up the board and get to the bond market. Here's the move for you. Ten consecutive sessions of 10-year yields closing above 4%. Looks like we might do that today. Depends what we get on retail sales in about two hours, but 423.46 would take a major move, a major breakdown for that to change. Yields are higher this morning, Lisa, by another four basis points on a 10-year. There's been a shift over the past week, and I think that it's really notable that not only are people not pricing in substantially higher rates in the U.S., but they are pricing out rate cuts. So they are buying into this idea of higher for longer. That's got to change the conversation in terms of valuations. To me, this is actually a bigger deal than saying that the Fed's going to raise rates to a place where it's definitely going to break things and then something's going to collapse and they're going to they're going to cut rates dramatically. This is basically saying that rates are going to stay at around 5%. By July next year, that is a new normal that people have not fully reassessed. The two years screaming it. Exactly. Very close to five. We talked lots about the tens because that's where the bigger move has been over the last month. But a two-year yield is very close to 5% all over again. So you have to wonder why we haven't seen a bigger reset or whether we have seen the reset and how long markets can continue to shrug off a concern about longer rate, uh, high rates in the U.S., China not having a good time of it uh, right now, and concerns just globally about what happens with further rate hikes over in Europe. Again, I just say, you put this together, you start to wonder, you know, is this going to be a tumultuous couple of months? Tumultuous. That's mm. what it's been so far. Yes, exactly. Putting the squeeze on dollar bears. Check out the FX market. Bit of a change today. A break for them. The euro, just a touch stronger. Sterling, a touch stronger as well. 127.08 on cable. That's the pound against the US dollar. Record wage growth. So just when you think they're done, <laughs> they might have to come back in over at the Bank of England and hike all over again. 7.8% wage growth. That's without bonuses. It was expected to be 7.4%. Again, we were talking about the end of the cycle. We were asking people questions the last Bank of England meeting. OK, so are they done? And people are like, yeah, they should be. They should hike one more time just for cosmetic reasons. But other than that, they don't need to. Really? Right? At what point does this really start to bite? Think about the mortgage pain in the UK. And we've covered this several times. The difference in the structure of the mortgage market in the UK, say, compared to the United States. You can Lock them in here stateside for 30 years, 2%. Lucky you. I won't go into that now. In the <laughs> United <will>. Kingdom, <laughs> in the United Kingdom, there's going to be a lot of people that have to come into this market in the next year or so and, and eat some of this. And it's going to hurt. It's going to really hurt. Which raises a question to me, and, and I've been thinking a lot about this. If we have seen the rate hikes that we've seen so far, and they have not made a material difference, does that mean they don't work? Does it mean that the long and variable lags are just not really going to bring down inflation in the correct way because it's not going to materially affect wages? So what other tools do some of these central banks have to deploy in order to really rein in inflation? Dependent on region, different answer. But stateside, Bill Dudley, the former president of the New York Fed, wrote a great piece on this in the last couple of weeks. Maybe we've just seen the impact already. They were super short. They've worked their way through the system and it's done. That's the Dudley question. Neil Dutch of Renmac, I think, would have some sympathy with that view. Others just to believe, hold on, patience. Perhaps they're just longer and wait. Especially, again, in the U.S., we've got 30-year mortgage rates. Although in the U.K., where there is a much more direct bleed through, the fact that you're still seeing wage growth at such an elevated level raises some questions about whether these uh, rate hikes have really had the impact that people were expecting them to have. We're sterling a touch stronger this morning. The pound against the U.S. dollar, about 127. Under surveillance this morning, China's central bank unexpectedly cutting the rate on its one-year loans by the most since 2020, as economic activity in the country continues to weaken. We have actually heard from the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on China calling the slowdown a, quote, risk factor for the U.S. economy. How big a risk factor is it, Bramo, for the U.S. economy? Honestly, everyone who we talk to keeps saying it's not that big of a risk factor. Joanne Feeney, she said, eh, that's not really dramatic enough, right? So at what point do we start to say, OK, these economies have more de uh, have decoupled more than people previously expected? That said, there are some corporations that have a lot of sales in China. I'm thinking, you know. Tesla, Apple. I'm thinking Apple, I'm yeah. thinking others, and what that could do could be substantial. Is this dramatic enough? Donald Trump indicted in Atlanta over efforts to overturn his 2020 election defeat in Georgia. It's the fourth criminal case brought against the former president. In a statement, Trump's lawyers calling the indictment, quote, shocking and absurd. Lisa, we've got New York, 
we've got Florida, we've got Washington, and now we've got Georgia. And arguably, people are going to be paying attention more to this one, not only because of some of the phone calls and the allegations and the number of people who are roped up into it. It's uh, Donald Trump as well as 18 of his associates, but also it's going to be televised. So you can just imagine. Is that being confirmed? Be a Is that actually going to be televised? It's believed to be televised. Previous ones have been televised. In this court, uh, they allow things to be televised for public interest. So people are expecting it to be televised. So at what point do we say, OK, all press is good press, is it? I mean, in a courtroom, if you have the airtime, is that going to be a good thing, a positive thing for Donald Trump? Or, I don't know. Well, let's just say there's a lot of public interest in that and this too. Hawaiian Electric's future in doubt, with a sell-off wipe in more than $1 billion from the company's value. The supplier of power to roughly 95% of the state's residents under increasing scrutiny over the course of the deadly Maui wildfire. No official cause has been found, but the scrutiny that this stock, this company, is under at the moment is painful. That stock getting hammered over the last couple of days. Why would any utility owner, stock owner, want to own this when they don't understand the liability? And that's really the commentary that we've been hearing, because if they are found liable, the likelihood that they will go bankrupt, people were just saying, pretty high, right? Because what's the liability, uh, considering that it was a massive amount of damage? Did you see how much damage? Oh, heartbreaking. Were? Oh, it's, it's heartbreaking. 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 Much more on that a little bit later in the programme. Jordan Rochester joins us now, G10 FX strategist over at Nomura. Jordan, great to catch up with you, buddy. Let's just start in the UK at the Bank of England. Record wage growth. Are we bringing them back in for more rate hikes to come? John, I think that wage number will definitely make the Bank of England absolutely think about raising rates at the next meeting. We think there'll be two more rate hikes this year. So we already thought there was enough data to tell them you should probably keep more hiking more. I do think the risks are that we get a weaker services CPI, perhaps not this month, maybe next month, and that the risks are actually tilted to just one hike rather than two. The idea of having two, maybe three, would require a reacceleration in that services CPI. So I always, John, think that the labour market is the most lagged indicator to track as a central banker. Rewind back two years ago, the ECB, the Bank of England, all these other central banks that were pointing out weak wages as a reason not to raise rates was actually a, a ridiculous thing to look at because you missed all of the energy and commodities inflation that was coming. And it's, it's why we are where we are today with central banks having to make up for lost time with all these rate hikes quite late on in that cycle, John. So strong wages, fantastic for those workers, pretty difficult for the Bank of England to turn dovish with those numbers. Is sterling positive or sterling negative if they have to hike more? Well, look at the reaction today. Euro sterling is the way to look at it. Sterling tried to rally, and then it came back off, and Euro sterling is pretty much flat on the day. If the Bank of England raised rates at 25 basis points like we expect, it wouldn't really move the needle for sterling. I think what will be really interesting is if we get some more negative news on growth. We're starting to see that in China, for example, but we're also having pretty dismal surveys out of the UK as well when it comes to price pressures. They're all turning lower. Maybe at the next meeting we'll get a better sense of whether that we will get that extra 50, so two 25s in a row. How much is that weakness that we're seeing in China bleeding through not only to the UK but Europe uh, and the euro? I think what you were saying earlier, Lisa, is spot on. There has been a little bit of decoupling. You look at the, the likes of risk on in the U.S. market, the, the move in U.S. yields. Yet, if you were to use the usual frameworks, when China slows down like this, usually it's risk off and very dovish, and it leads to um, dollar strength. And uh, this is kind of what we're seeing in dollar C and H. So that's a clear trade. We think dollar C and H gets to 750, perhaps. That's the sort of move we're looking for. We're doing it in a basket format. But it's not leading to massive euro dollar weakness, which is very odd. And it's similar for sterling as well. It used to be if CNH moved like this, you would absolutely have to be short euro. And the reason for that is because of this decoupling. Equities are rallying in the US more broadly over the past few months, and that's held up euro. Can it last? And I noticed that you actually abandoned your strong euro call recently, and you said, you know what, I actually see it being a bit weaker uh, from here. What triggers that, if not the bad data out of China and this concern around the inability to stimulate? The hardest part about FX, Lisa, is there's three pillars to consider. One is what's going on with equities, two, what's going on with rates, and three, what's going on with commodities. And for quite some time, I was leaning on that equity pillar. The, raz the, uh, the sort of rally we'd had in equities over the past few months was one of the reasons we had that euro dollar call. 
We're looking for top side. We still are by year end, but in the short term, I see the other two pillars really dominating, which is the rates market says euro dollar should be towards 105. That's not a good thing where we are at current levels. And of course, with commodities, we've, we've had a much higher in oil prices. And natural gas, one of the biggest imports for the euro area energy uh, supply crisis, has perked up recently of late. So it's made me more nervous watching dollar CNH move the way it is. Default risks building up in China, low credit demand. We saw new one loans collapse. That in the short term, given we've not got not very little data now until we get the next CPI and NFP reports, and we've got Jackson Hole, but I think in the short term that they're not catalyst enough to boost euro. I'm surprised euro wasn't on an 111 handle after that CPI report. So a few disappointments with the reactions in the market. And going forward over the next two weeks, only Jackson Hole to really talk about. That's not a reason to be long euro dollar. But we are long euro versus Norway and we are long euro versus uh, sterling. So there are still euro upside bias in our view. Jordan, what you just described smells like eurozone stagflation. Is that what it is? Well, inflation is going to come down, John. It's going to come down quite quickly according to the sort of PPI and survey. So the stagflation concerns, I think, were more last year's story. But the growth numbers, ZEWs this morning, were pretty disappointing. I thought maybe we start to see positive momentum in European data surprises. They were so weak that maybe they improved. But ultimately, the survey suggests that it's going to be a pretty weak outlook for European growth. And my problem on that side is I'm not sure where the next stimulus is going to come from. The Fed's not cutting rates until March next year. The ECB is not going to be talking about uh, cutting rates until later next year, October, November time. China's not doing a big fiscal stimulus so far. So it, it is a combination that makes it really hard for me to see why surveys and growth surveys should really pick up. So yes, in answer to your question, it's still a bit like stagflation, but hopefully that inflation component comes down. So Jordan, just quickly, you think Lagarde is done? We do. We do think the ECB is done because we think that the data over the next few months will develop in such a way that will justify no more rate hikes. I think the ECB and the Fed have both introduced the skip concept. And hopefully by the time we get a few more data reports, that will then say we don't maybe need to hike at all. The Bank of England is in a weird place where they don't give that sort of strong forward guidance about skipping or not. Hopefully we start to see that build up as a narrative for the UK as well in the next few months too. I've got a birthday present for you. We're not going to talk about Aston Villa, OK? Just going to let you go. Aww. We won't talk about the score over the weekend. Jordan, happy birthday. <laughs> so Thanks, sweet. John. Cheers, guys. I'm tearing Jordan up. Rochester and Amora. Jordan, thank you. Has he gone? He's gone. 5-1. He, they got absolutely <laughs> oh, yeah. battered. He's still Man, there. I know he's The there. kindness. The they got, kindness. They got absolutely really is. crushed. Is that really a birthday present for Crushed. Him? Your birthday presents crushed. are really gold. He's going to go home <laughs> feeling just so warm and fuzzy. The euro. Nothing warm and fuzzy about what's happening in the eurozone right now. They've got an inflation problem. Rates, they've been hiked aggressively, much more so than we thought they would be 18 months ago. And now they've got to slow down with their biggest trading partner, China. And China clearly can't respond to it in the way that the euro boards would like them to. This question that Jordan's asked, I think, is super, super important. Where does the circuit breaker come from on the policy side? China's cut rates today. People would call it aggressive. That's a big move for them. It's not enough. It's insufficient. Heard a lot of that from the south side. Where does it come from? Who else? What next? The U.S. maybe. I mean, this is something that people are looking at, which is the reason why Citigroup analysts talked about the lost decade for China. And the read-through for Europe is pretty pretty stark, considering how connected those economies are. If that's the case, why isn't priced in more? If that's the case, why, to, to the point that why we're isn't getting, the euro who, weaker? Right, from Kit Jukes's point, why isn't the euro weaker? And why are people still seeing strength there? To me, again, I don't understand the market moves today completely because people are seeing ongoing inflation, weakness in Europe, but ongoing strength in the US. And treasuries are selling off. Exactly. We've done this a few times over the last couple of days. Typically, years and years ago, when you used to wake up to these headlines, I remember 2014, 15, 16, the China slowdown concerns were really prominent over that period. You'd wake up on mornings like this and treasuries would rally really hard and that's just not happening right now. The story of decoupling is a very big one that's underpinned this feeling that this is going to be inflationary for the US, not disinflationary. The 10-year yield this morning higher by four basis points, your 10-year 423, your equity market slightly negative. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg.
should be repricing. The fact that it's not is not a sign of, of health. It, it's a sign of dysfunction. Um, and I, I think that that's something that could come back to bite us in terms of, you know, we, we begin to generate some momentum in the economy and all of a sudden people want, need to move for, for work or, or when they've retired, they want to sell their house and switch to a different house. Um, you know, there are no trade downs happening anymore. The housing market in America is looking more and more frozen by the day. Drew Mattis, Chief Market Strategist over at MetLife, just dead on. The story so far, no one wants to sell their house if they've got a 2% mortgage. No one wants to buy a house if they have to take on an 8% mortgage. And Lisa, why would you? And why is that going to change anytime soon? Which is why you've seen home builders absolutely skyrocket this year. Warren Buffett are revealing that he's actually going all in on the home builders as well, because they build homes because there aren't unavailable. And then they extend financing that is lower than a 7.5% mortgage rate. And it has offset some of the lack of inventory. I mean, of course, not to be catastrophic, but my mind sure. immediately goes to, OK, what does this mean about supply later on? You know, down the line, I immediately go there. Does okay. that mean we're going to be oversupplied when you unfreeze the market? When rates you know, go back down to zero? When rates go back down, um, not to, quite to zero, but you know what I'm saying? That That's sort of... The know, headline right. we should write, though, is not despite high interest rates. <laughs> right. It's because of high interest rates. But that's the rates. weird thing, right? So how does this develop? Does this basically mean that the market sells off when they cut rates? I mean, is that basically where we're heading right now? It's kind of bizarre, isn't it? Your equity market on the S&P 500 right now, equity futures negative by 0.6%. The data out of China overnight, terrible. Shortly before it dropped, China cut interest rates by the most since 2020. In the bond market, if you're concerned about slowdown, global growth concerns, usually you'd see yields lower. We're not seeing that whatsoever in the Treasury market over the last month or so. Ten-year yields are aggressively higher over the previous three weeks by 30 basis points. This week, we add some again up by four basis points this morning on a 10-year at 4.2326. I want to turn to Home Depot and look at how that stock is performing. It's a relative upside surprise relative to pretty downbeat expectations. There is a share buyback scheme in the mix as well. Lisa, the stock is lower by 0.3%. Back in May, you'll remember they cut their outlook. Things haven't been great for this name over the last few months. Have you ever done a do-it-yourself project? At no. Home? <laughs> this is my shocked face. <laughs> Have you been in a Home Depot? Of course, yes. I've okay. been to a Home Depot. Yeah, yeah. So, and you like the Christmas least, tree is yeah, from yeah. Home Depot. <laughs> okay, that's it. You don't even hang your own pictures. Come on, you totally do I've that. got a lot of okay. things to say about Home Depot. Okay, yeah. Great store. Yeah, okay. Great that's... logistics too. Fantastic delivery. Is that what you have Lots to say about Lots of things to say. That's what well, I've got to say. <laughs> but if you want to ask me about <laughs> drilling and hanging things up, I'm not that guy. I have a lot of friends, and they are making their homes better because they're not moving around. And that is basically the idea, is that because they did lock in a mortgage, just saying, at 3.5%, not that you have any feelings about that. Jack Caffrey at J.P. Morgan said the same thing. This was the dynamic that he was going to look for. Yeah. And they're basically saying that that's going to continue, even though the big ticket items, the you know dishwashers and such. Are you saying because I don't so hang up pictures, I don't associate with people who do? Is no, that what you're saying? That you have friends that do it, but I wouldn't have friends that you do. You associate with me. I hang my own pictures. No, I have people who are not just hanging their own pictures. They're like you know renovating. You know people that do. Like that. You've got friends. I've got friends who hang up pictures. Cool. <laughs> Drew Redding joins us now, home builders analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Drew, can we start with Home Depot? What have you learned from the numbers this morning? Yeah, so Home Depot had a modest beat. Um, same store sales down 2%. Expectations were for a decline of about 4%. I mean, this was pretty much in line with what we were expecting. There's been some noise quarter to quarter with lumber and weather. Um, the key takeaway is that they reaffirmed their full year guidance calling for a decline of 2 to 5%, which includes a backdrop of the broader home improvement market falling 5 to 10%. Um, so, you know, they reaffirmed this back at their investor day a couple of months ago, so not a whole lot of new um, news from this release. They did confirm that there's still caution among consumers and that big ticket discretionary projects are still under a little bit of pressure. Forget big tech. One of the stories of the year in the equity market has been this rip roaring rally in the home builders. Drew, Lita and I were just talking about how frozen this housing market is in America. Drew, can you put some numbers on that? Just how frozen are things at the moment? Yeah, so you, if you look at the existing home market, um, sales are down more than 30% from their peak. I looked at the 30-year the mortgage rate before I came on this morning, and we're at 7.25%. So, I mean, that's kind of startling. And just to give you some perspective of how out of whack rates and prices seem, 
um, home prices would have to fall somewhere around 35% in order for monthly payments relative to incomes to fall back to trend levels. Now, we don't think that's going to happen. Um, the main reason is because the market is frozen. There's no inventory in the existing home market, and that's really what's put the builders in a unique situation. They've been able to bring new product to market. They've been able to help customers make their monthly payments work by offering rate buy downs. So they've kind of been in the sweet spot with higher rates, which is something we, you know, we and others didn't really expect coming into this year. Bear with me, Drew. But immediately I start thinking, does this mean that when the Fed cuts rates, or if they cut rates, maybe they're going to hold rates here for a very long time, most people expect them rates to go down, that home builders will sell off, that that will actually reduce some of the proposition that they offer at a time where you start to see a little bit more loosening in the housing market? So it's an interesting question. And the reason I said that they're uniquely positioned is because we think they could benefit in the current environment where rates are around seven and they're buying them down to five and a half. But if rates fall back to five and a half percent naturally, you've expanded the buyer pool. So it in increases mobility. So we think even in that environment, builders can still do well. I think the biggest risk, and it's not something we're seeing now, is that you get more stress in the labor market and unemployment starts to spike. That's where you would start to see pressures on home prices and more supply coming to market because there's forced selling activity. Um, that's just something we haven't had to this point. Home builders have also been in a sweet spot because you've seen lumber prices come in. And from Home Depot's earnings, that's been actually a headwind for them. That's been a problem. They've actually seen margins come in uh, with some of their supplies and their sales increase not able to be passed along as much. How much is that kind of one of the variables that can back up a home builder or not if you start to see lumber prices go back up? Yeah, so right now, profitability for the builders in terms of gross margin has benefited from the, the fall in lumber prices. We expect that to continue um, over the near term, but they have started to take back higher, and that, you know, that could add some pressure to margins alongside the increased use of sales incentives. So it's certainly something to watch because, obviously, as you would expect, lumber is the biggest component of a house. When, Drew, do you expect mortgage rates, as you mentioned, seven and a quarter, seven and a half percent, if you look at bank rate, when will that actually trickle out into valuations in a more material way? Are we just basically saying that because of the term structure, it's not going to have the ramifications that anyone expected it to have? Yeah, it's certainly an interesting dynamic that's that's taken shape. And I think the reason that higher rates aren't having an impact on, on home prices and the valuation of houses is because there's no supply. In, in order for price to see, to see a dramatic decline, you'd have to have that forced selling activity, which would be associated with an economic recession and rising unemployment. Um, we've got very well-heeled borrowers out there. We haven't seen those exotic loans this cycle. So we have good borrowers. They're locked into low fixed rates. So there's really no reason um, for them to be forced to sell absent a broader economic recession. Uh, Drew, can you give me that number again for those that missed it? What do housing prices need to fall by to go back to trend repayment levels? So in the existing home market, home prices would have to fall about 35 percent in order to for that monthly payment relative to income to kind of fall back to those trend levels we talked about. 35 percent. Drew, thank you. Drew Running there of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you very much. The Drew's point, recession is what unlocks this. Recession ultimately because you get the forced selling, one and two you get the Federal Reserve that arguably is going to reduce interest rates, right? Until then, it looks like we're locked up and frozen for a while. Which means that people are less mobile, which means that people are also not able to afford homes for the first time, which means that people are moving back in with their parents, just saying. But all of these kinds of uh, things, I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around this idea that we were expecting that 35% drop, and it didn't happen at all, and you're seeing prices increase dramatically because of lack of supply. I'm just trying to wrap my head around what that means about the efficacy of monetary policy. Well, for sure. What does it mean? Do they have to stay here for longer or go even further? That's the reason why I said I think that staying here for longer is actually an arguably more destructive to the economy in a certain way than raising so high that something breaks and then having to cut, right? I mean, this idea that if you start to keep rates at 5% for a longer period of time, at some point you're going to have to refinance. Well, certainly more destructive for the companies that are going to refinance exactly. in the next 
12 months or so, particularly in high yield. Great lineup this morning. Dan Greenhouse of Solace Alternative Asset Management joining us shortly. Look out for that conversation in about five minutes' time. Tons to talk about in the equity market, the bond market too, foreign exchange as well. In the equity market right now, we're negative by 0.6% on the S&P. If you are just joining us, rate cuts in China, awful economic data, so bad that they're not going to report what's happening with youth unemployment. The official that. reason for that is we need to optimise the, the report. What does that mean? I think they're worried about people leaving or just about to graduate being registered as being unemployed or something like that. But optimize, though, that word. I was thinking to myself, this is just the well, most... Op- optimal like, for who? Yeah, well, I, <laughs> well, that's exactly it. I'm just thinking, you know, OK, is this just speak for... Just leave us alone. The White House needs to optimize CPI. It just needs to be, like, lower. I need lower. to optimize my balance sheet. It needs to be lower. This is Bloomberg. There's still this widespread consensus that the euro area is going to outperform the US. And cyclically, that doesn't seem to add up. The US consumer still remains extremely resilient. I think the deflationary forces are still out there. If I think of the risk to inflation, it's not to the downside, it's to the upside. In order for the global economy to be doing well, all the boats have got to be moving in the same direction. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. It's just one of those moments in the global economy. You wake up every single morning asking one question, what happened in China? From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market negative by 0.6% to answer the question, what happened in China? Ray cuts happened in China. I thought you were going to say another one of those mornings you wake up and you wonder what is happening because the market's actually pricing it in. What we're looking at in China is a rate cut, the deepest rate cut since 20. 20, right before releasing data that was worse than expected, showing a re- real deceleration and lack of growth in the world's second biggest economy. Now the question goes to what can they do to really revive growth? And everyone keeps saying, we're not sure that they have the will or the power to do that. Went through some of the commentary already in the previous hour. I'll share it with you again. Standard Chartered, the cut has been aggressive. Sock Gen, this is unlikely to be the last measure. What does it mean for the equity market over there? Mislav Mateka at JP Morgan in the investment bank has just held the line on this repeatedly. We stay unexcited, unexcited by China exposure despite periodic bounces on the back of stimulus hopes and news continue fading this. That was published earlier this week. Does it still hold? He was absolutely right because the reaction to this, even though there was stimulus, and usually that would be a catalyst for a risk on move, you saw the Hang Seng down 1%, right? So you still saw that sell-off reassert itself in China at a time when it's clear that finally the government is willing to do some stimulus. The implication here is it is not going to be enough. And there are some fundamental dissonances between their goals from the Communist Party and trying to generate some real meaningful growth. The two big stories this morning, then. One is China. The other is the U.S. retail story. Retail sales coming get a little bit later. Big focus on the consumer. Lots of retail earnings as well. You're going to hear from Target and Walmart in the next 48 hours. We've already heard from Home Depot. The bank dropped up in the market as we await some of this data a little bit later this morning. Treasuries are selling off again. The 10-year yield is higher by another three or four basis points. Lisa, the 10-year yield now at 423. We're talking about new highs for 2023. And when you strip out uh, the yield and you look just at the inflation adjusted rate that you're getting on the 10-year, it is the highest going back to 2009. Retail sales plays into this. The consumer keeps spending. Americans are going to spend. That's what they do. And so here comes the question, how long can they keep doing it? Is this just the prime, the Amazon prime effect? I, You know, honestly, how many times are we going to hear that? Oh, this is just Amazon. Everyone went out there and bought things. And at what point is but- they did. I mean, so they did. <laughs> they did, but they have the money to buy it. And they keep having the money, despite people saying that they would have run out of money uh, from their savings by earlier this year. Let's turn to the price action. Equities a bit softer then, negative by 0.6% on the S&P. I've mentioned a bond market move. Yield time by three basis points, 4.2247. Against the higher yield story, the dollar's been a little bit stronger, at least this morning, weaker against the euro, 109.32. Interesting to see, especially in light of what we saw over in China. 8.30 a.m. is that U.S retail sales number. The expectation is for a reacceleration uh, month over month of retail sales. Everyone's going to be talking about Amazon Prime. Home Depot came out. Their share is basically bouncing around in pre-market after basically delivering in line with expectations. At 10 a.m., it's related to Home Depot, actually, the NAHB Housing Market Index, home builder sentiment. Again, 
how long can they remain in the sweet spot at a time where mortgage rates are seven and a half percent, right? I mean, this has basically been the story that keeps on giving and the biggest surprise or one of them uh, this year that's been full of surprises this year. That's all I can say. Upside surprises. Stateside, yeah, anyway. Exactly. And then everywhere else, maybe not so much. 11 a.m., Minneapolis uh, Fed President Neil Kashkari is going to speak about why Jonathan Farrow didn't lock in an interest rate at three and a half percent. No, he, about why he's to blame. Honestly, I'm curious to see whether he gives any tea leaves for Jackson Hole in terms of how their paradigm is going to really shift. In other words, are they going to be looking at holding rates higher for longer? Is that thought of as more effective than going further? I'm going to town Neil in the diner next week. I know you will. I'm going to be there. He kept rates too low for too long. The mortgage market's frozen now because of it. It's keeping rates too high for too long. You're going to be the man who yells at a cloud. I'm not. Whenever, whenever gonna, I see him, I'm yes. nice to Neil. Dan Greenhouse joins us now, Chief Strategist <laughs> at Solace Alternative Asset Management. Dan, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How you we doing? We park China for a moment and just focus on what's happening in this bond market. 423 on a 10-year. What do you believe is the dominant factor under, underpinning this move over the last month? Yeah, I, listen, I, I don't know that I can disaggregate what's the dominant factor, but it's what we all know. It's the supply. It's the stickiness of a presumed stickiness of the Fed funds rate. Um, it's the idea that inflation is not going immediately back to 2%. I think all of it plays into if I had gun to the head, if I had to, this is a bad analogy, but but if I had to pick one dominant factor right now, it would probably be the supply story. It's it's a, it's another example of when when a, 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 a a dominant theme in my investing life has been whenever you think something's priced in, it's not priced in. And we knew this deluge of issuance was coming. We know the budget deficit is, for lack of a better phrase, out of control, blah, blah, blah. Uh, out comes this headline on the refunding auctions going up in size, and everybody suddenly wakes up to that which has been a reality for many of us for a long time. Not all 423s are created equally. The reason I ask the question, what's behind it? What's behind it should matter for how we invest after that. If it's about better economic data, then you can make the argument that maybe risk assets are going to be OK in certain places. If it's about supply, what does it mean for what happens in equities, what happens with credit, what happens with risk appetite more broadly? I think the problem with this discussion is, for many of us, and certainly people older than, than all three of us, they've been wrestling with the fiscal issue since the Boskin Commission 20 years ago. Uh, we've been told repeatedly that that we're at the edge of a fiscal cliff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a, uh, a white noise-ish uh, characteristic to this discussion. And the truth is, it's still the case. It's very hard to invest, whether it's Home Depot or, or um, Fortinet or pick your stock here, with any idea that, that investors are going to wake up and deem the U.S. grease, to use the analogy of the day. I, it's, it's very hard to assume that's going to happen any time in the immediate, uh, in, in the immediate uh, time frame. But at the same time, if it happened tomorrow, everybody would go, oh, obviously. And that's the dichotomy that you wrestle with on these big macro issues, whether it's, whether it's a deficit or it's Social Security or unfunded liabilities. How long do you think it's going to be before someone comes on and says, the U.S. is the new Greece? I mean, if basically. Trichet takes Powell's job, maybe. By the way, if you're on Twitter for more than 30 seconds, the U.S. has been Greece for, for that's 20 true. years. Well, but that's, that's not saying that much, <laughs> which raises this question about the white noise more broadly, this complacency about what's priced in. You said, what was the adage? Uh, the adage that, you know, whatever you think it's priced in, it's not. Sure. This morning, we woke up to China and this belief in easing and more easing down the pike and a very counterintuitive reaction in markets with people basically shrugging it off, seeming to say this time is different, that they won't be able to stimulate their way out of this. Do you think that that's the accurate pricing? Um... Well, listen, we, it is true. We have known for quite some time now that China is weak. The macro data has corroborated that. The companies that invest uh, particularly large amounts in China, whether it's Starbucks or Caterpillar, et cetera, uh, have certainly corroborated the idea that China has been weak for some time. And I think it's correct to view today's announcement as a um, as a symptom rather than a cause, if you will. It's 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 the inevitable effect of the weak rebound from the COVID recovery. And you 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 mentioned in the tease sort of maybe they don't have enough wherewithal or ability to to rescue the economy this time. And I think this is ultimately what, what a lot of people have believed for many years, which is ultimately state-controlled, centralized, planned economies over time just simply don't perform as well as free market economies do. And as such, you don't have quite the ability to self-regulate and self-improve, uh, if you will, along the likes of, say, United States or Western Europe. Can the U.S. keep doing well if China does not? I think for sure. Uh, it's the same. It's a corollary to the can the market go up if Apple goes down type argument, um, which which has been a debate for 15, 20 years and is no less uh, no less false today than it's been the entire time. I, I, listen, I think China is certainly a large consumer. Uh, we are certainly a large consumer of their goods. They've been an export of deflation and all that 
big macro story that, that we all know so well is in the process of, of shifting. But at the end of the day, the U.S. has never gone into recession. To simplify it, the U.S. has never gone into a recession because of something that's happened exogenously. So to dovetail this into where we started the conversation with yields, and we're seeing yields move higher in the U.S., even with this concern that should be a risk-off kind of feel, which traditionally would take yields lower. What does that do to some of the real estate, to some of the other kind of term structures that have avoided the true pain related to higher rates that might feel a little bit more the longer this grinds yeah, out? Yeah, we, we talked about this last time I was on, and it's been a central animating theme of mine for some time. There's a Bloomberg story this morning, I think, that says Fed officials are shifting from how high to how long. This is something we've been talking about for for six or nine months now. Whether you got to five and a half or five seventy five or whatever it might be is far less consequential than how long you leave rates at that higher level. Because if you listen, first of all, from my standpoint in, in the equity and credit markets, the longer you leave rates up there, the more refinancing risk that you introduce to the bond market. So we all know the high yield markets yielding call it eight and a half, but the coupon in the high yield bond market is like six and a half. So there's there's 200 basis points of spread there as those bonds start to mature over the next two years. And, and there's roughly $2 trillion worth of IG high yield and loans coming due over the next two years that are set to reset at presumably, not loans, but in, in, in um, IG and high yield. So, so the longer you leave rates up there, the more refinancing risk you introduce for, the let's say, the equity and the credit markets. And if you listen to someone like, let's say, Barry Sternlicht or anyone in the real estate market, they'd echo a similar theme from a different viewpoint, which is from the real estate market. The longer you leave rates up there, the more difficult it is to get all these deals done. And we know that, obviously, offices in, in real or certain parts of offices in real trouble. And, and, and again, I, I can't emphasize this enough. I imagine many viewers know it. Six months from now, if rates are still five plus percent, we're going to be having a much different conversation than we are now. I'm shocked that real estate moguls don't want rates up here. Shocked. Although they're all raising money every from time, distressed every time real I, estate every funds. Every time I, I see those headlines. Dan, let's finish there. You mentioned it. For someone like you, when do you start to worry about that? We understand the maturity profiles of certain companies and when that maturity wall is going to hit. Let's say it is out there, end of 24, start of 25. When do you start to back away from some of those credits? Ahead of that, yeah. The problem you wrestle with as a, as an asset manager, as a fund manager, um, is is w when I advise our CEO and CIO and, and say this is what we should do or this is what we should think. There's a catalyst component to it, and otherwise it's just uh, to, to borrow a phrase from earlier in, in in the discussion, a white noise. And in terms of when you get real, I think the, to oversimplify this conversation, to touch on something about the consumer that you mentioned earlier. At the end of the day, this is all about the labor market. And if the labor, if the unemployment rate stays in the mid threes and wages are doing fine and prices continue to fall, then the economy should, on balance, do well. Now, obviously, that's separate from the rate conversation, but it's hard to make the case that things are going to get meaningfully worse if the labor market stays where it is. And right now, it's at three and a half percent. Dan, it's good to see you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Thanks yeah. for being here. Dan Greenhouse of Solace Alternative Asset Management on China, U.S. retail, this bond market, and this bond market is getting trickier and trickier by the day for Treasuries. And I just keep thinking about what uh, Dan just said, which is it's all white noise until it isn't, right? It's all white noise until the labor market cracks. And that's what I think we're looking at. When does it crack and when does it become something more? Pretty depressing stuff, Bramo. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, on brand. <laughs> we're just tuning in. Say. Welcome to the show on the S&P 500. We're negative here by 0.6%. Coming up a little bit later on this morning, looking forward to catching up with Bob Dole of Crossmart. We'll catch up with Bob in about 48 minutes from now. At least as we look ahead to retail, sales in about one hour and 20 minutes. And so some people are saying, well, just wait. Retail sales will start falling off a cliff. They've been saying that for a while, right? And they're going to re-accelerate. And now people are saying it's Amazon Prime Day. So everyone went out and bought all the deals. So at what point do we just sort of throw in the towel and realize that consumer is just going to keep on buying? On the domestic front, you have seen some subtle signs, small ones from earnings. JetBlue, Southwest, some of the domestic-focused airlines flagging softening demand and dropping fares, we're told. I haven't witnessed that yet, yeah, but apparently fares, yeah. fares are coming down domestically. OK, that said, how much is it just this great rolling ball of money that's going from one area to another? It went away from goods, it went to services. Now people are sick of flying around everywhere, and now it's going to go back into another part Where, of the where's economy. Where's it going next? Uh, I don't know, maybe back to school supplies. <laughs> I don't know, just theoretically. I will say this. People are waiting for the student loan repayments to crimp some of the uh, dynamism that the U.S. consumer has. But do you know that 45 percent of borrowers say that they're not going to repay, that they're going to actually just be in default 
for the first year and that they don't have to get repaid anyway. I mean, this is according to a recent, this is credit card money. I wish we had more time on the clock because Dan Greenhouse had a corner of my eye. <laughs> I know he's got things to say and he's not got time to say them. <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P 500, <laughs> negative here by 0.6%. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. individual charged in the indictment is charged with one count of violating Georgia's Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act to accomplish the illegal goal of allowing Donald J. Trump to seize the presidential term of office beginning on January 20th, 21. Quite a statement. Fanny Willis there, the district attorney of Fulton County, Georgia, laying out the indictment against former President Donald Trump and 18 others over efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election in the state. In a statement, Trump's attorneys calling the charges, quote, shocking and absurd. Lisa... We're losing count of the amount of cases here, aren't we? We're on to four? Yeah, this is on to four, and a lot of people are looking at this one in particular because it is a state case. So even if uh, Trump does become president, he cannot absolve himself from this. He can't pardon himself, and that's one thing people are looking at. I personally am watching to see whether it's going to be televised and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for the former president's candidential uh aspirations. His campaign? His campaign, yes. Will it be on the stage next week? I ask that every single day. Is he going to be on the stage next week? People don't know. We hear from Chris Christie saying, yeah, he will. He'll come. He'll come because that's what he wants. But we shall see. His uh, advisors, I'm sure, are saying, don't go. I forgot who said it yesterday. There was a 2% chance and one point of that was his ego. And that one percentage point was kind of important. And that's kind of 80 percent of everything that he does. So there yeah, you go. So there we go. If you are just tuning in, that's one big story for us. Another is China. So allow me to go through some of the price action, just get you up to speed on what's happening elsewhere. Equities are lower by 0.6 percent on the S&P 500, as you were in the Treasury market. And if you've been following the Treasury market, as you were means one thing, yields up. Treasury's down. 422.87, yields higher by four basis points. Lots of concerns about what's happening over in China. The data wasn't great. We've had the biggest rate cut, Lisa, going back to 2020, and a strong suggestion there needs to be a whole lot more than that. And the strong suggestion bearing out in equity markets where you see Chinese equities selling off despite the move for support. This, again, points to this feeling that they need to do more, and it's unw they're unwilling to do that, at least in any measures that they've laid out so far. It is not a bazooka, as one commentator it's said. It's quite telling that markets haven't responded to this positively. You might expect maybe a rally in the equity market a rally in treasuries, yields dropping, maybe even copper, base metals picking up. I'm not seeing that. They have some fundamental problems with people just not going out and buying. How do you deal with that if people don't feel optimistic enough to go out there and spend? And that is what you've seen in the behavior of the reopening of China. And it does go to the youth unemployment rate. It does go to the fact that they don't see where they're going to get jobs, although we don't know because they didn't release it. Well, you won't job. see it yeah, exactly, anymore. Because it's going to be optimized. They're optimizing it. You want the full quote on the optimization? <laughs> Please. The National Bureau of Statistics, according to a spokesperson, they said they won't be publishing youth unemployment anymore for the time being because they need, quote, further optimization and more research needs to be done. And here's the quote. This is the official line. Whether students looking for a job before graduation should be counted in the labor statistics. OK, here's my issue with all of this. Does anyone actually read this and say, oh, OK, well, this is good news? Then we won't trade on this and we'll just assume the best. Or is it basically just they're trying to figure out how to get their messaging correctly for the next read? I mean, basically, what does this do to the credibility that they don't really necessarily have developed in markets with respect to the integrity of their data? It just sort of it doesn't really necessarily affect things that much. It's not for us. It's for domestic consumption. Right. You'd have to imagine that's what it's about. And I wonder how much the domestic consumption is, you know, nods along versus it's like, OK, here's another thing that we're going to have to stab in the dark with. Let's head down to D.C. and catch up with Bloomberg's, Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson over in Washington, D.C. Wendy, wonderful to catch up with you. We've talked about the former president, some of the legal issues he faces in New York, Washington, D.C., in Florida. Talk to me about Georgia and what's different about this case. 
Well, first, as Lisa said, it is very important because were he to be reelected, he could not pardon himself. Fonnie Willis, the prosecutor in Atlanta, does not answer to Donald Trump, um, nor, do, nor do the people of Georgia necessarily. But the other thing that's really different about this case is the size and scope. It was, I mean, just by the numbers, it's a 98-page indictment with 41 criminal counts against 19 people. This isn't just Donald Trump and a bunch of unindicted co-conspirators as we saw with the last election interference case from D.C. This is Rudy Giuliani, a host of his other lawyers. Mark Meadows, the former White House chief of staff, is ensnared in this. And I think what's really important to remember is that we know they did all these things. They were playing out in real time. We were doing daily stories about their attempts to overturn the election. The big question now for all these prosecutors is to convince a jury that these were crimes. When will this actually start to matter in terms of the popularity ratings of Donald Trump? I mean, this basically has been a, a boost to his popularity, if anything. Will it continue to be? Well, it's, it's, we'll have to see how this plays out once it's past the prosecutors accusing him of crimes. I think once we get into the discovery, once we start seeing um, the evidence pile up, once juries start reacting to it, and once it's on trial, I think maybe there may be some, uh, some diminution of his popularity. And there already has been among moderate Republicans, independent voters, and of course, every Democrat. But there's you know, but I think perhaps, and I've been saying things like this since 2015, so who knows if I'm right, um, at some point people will see Donald Trump for who he is. There, there's a question going forward about uh, what the candidates, the other candidates to become the Republican nominee are going to say about these cases. Originally, they rallied behind the former president. Are they still? Yes. And that's I just don't understand the campaign strategy, let alone the you know authority or the, the whether they're right or wrong on this. It's uh, Vivek Ramaswamy came out, uh, I think it was overnight and said, yeah, I would write the amicus brief myself telling them to overturn this. And Ron DeSantis and the others are talking about the weaponization of the quote unquote Biden Justice Department and all of that. And then there's the what about Hunter Biden reaction. And, and I don't understand how you run against someone while you're defending them. It's an odd strategy, but maybe that's the way they think they will become more popular with primary voters. But it's not happening. And it'll be really interesting to watch the debate, even if he doesn't show up, if it becomes a isn't a Donald Trump great, we all agree, <laughs> debate. Well, we know not everyone's going to say that. The former vice president, Mike Pence, <laughs> is one. Another would be the former New Jersey governor, Governor Christie. Wendy, is that helping them or hurting them? Well, combined, they have about eight or nine percent of the Republican primary support. So I don't know. They've become much more popular with independent and suburban and Democratic voters for, you know, standing up um, to what they believe were crimes happening. But it's not helping them with Republican primary voters. I mean, right now, the biggest competitors to Donald Trump are, and by this, with a did, they are distant seconds and thirds, are Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy, and they are defending him. Wendy, thank you. Wendy Benjaminson down in Washington, D.C., a week away from that first debate for Republicans, hosted, of course, by Fox News. Lisa, how do you beat the former president if at the same time you are defending him, as Wendy put it? This has been the question, and no one really has an answer quite clearly, because nobody's really effectively really taking a stance one way or another. The people who do go against him are losing popularity. The people who, do, uh, who don't go against him are forced into a position where they're basically backing him, and he's their opponent. So how do you navigate this has been a real quagmire for them. I heard from Vivek Ramaswamy over the weekend talking about that he would take counsel from the former president if he got into the White House. They're trying to walk this very, very tight line, aren't they? Basically saying that we support him, but at the same time, I'm a better candidate than him. From a broader perspective, how have we priced this in? And I don't mean to just go back to markets because it's easier well, than talking about the I don't political. know how you price any of this but, in. But, but how do you sort of figure out where this is going when you have legally fraught candidates facing 
an election cycle at a time where we're worried about the debt, we're worried about geopolitical tensions. How do you then price in the potential for real unrest? I mean, honestly, I'm just thinking through what the ramifications could be going down, or is it all just white noise, as Dan Greenhouse says, well, until there's a catalyst? Park the hyperbole. Let's okay. go through the points that were made by Fitch in the last couple of weeks with the downgrade. One of them was a governance issue. If you've got worries about governance and institutional credibility in Washington, D.C., then there is a reason also to be concerned about the Treasury market as well. Especially at a time where there does seem to be a lot of political potential turmoil. The people are starting to game out a little bit. We heard that from Laurie Cavasina. Trying to cut through the signal and the noise is almost impossible at times in Washington and right now is one of those times. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500 negative by 0.5%. Sixty minutes away from U.S. retail sales data. Coming into that information, equities right now on the S&P 500 negative. We're down across the board, down by a half of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're lower by 0.49 percent. Yesterday, best day for the Nasdaq 100 of the month so far. So we snapped back. We snapped back down this morning off the back of concerns all over again over in China and high yields in the mix as well. Let's turn to the bond market. The 10-year yield is higher once again by three basis points. 422.67. Let's call it 423. For those of you who don't follow this market too closely, this is a new high for 2023. The highs of the cycle go back to October. They're about 430-ish, just north of 430 intraday. But Lisa, we're getting closer and closer on a 10-year. And I would say I'd flag the two-year too. Don't ignore what's happening at the front end. All this soft landing hopes and dreams and rate cuts early next year, your two-year, I think we can call that 5%, 497.56. There's a story underpinning this, which is is that the Fed is going to keep rates higher for longer, as seen in the two-year yield going up and staying at a higher level, and that it's not going to bring inflation down meaningfully to get those yields in, or at least the term premium is going to be higher going forward for some other reason. So you put that together. And what does that do to the rest of the risk complex? I don't know that people have fully appreciated that, but again, maybe it's all white noise. We need to identify the dominant factor behind it, which right now is really difficult to do, I know. Is it the yield curve? confusion over at the BOJ? Is it the additional supply? Is it something happening with the economic data? Take your pick. Is it the downgrade? I think most people shrug their shoulders at the downgrade. But ultimately, there's a ton going on at the same time, and it's hard to identify what is quite behind that move. And you add to that this idea that you have the likes of JP Morgan, of Western Asset Management, of HSBC, reconfirming the buy duration kind of call, that yields will come back down. So. Where are they? If there are so many buyers out there, why haven't you seen the institution step in in a material way, especially in light of slowing global growth, especially in light of what we saw out of China? Consensus view right now, without a doubt, on the Treasury market, it's difficult to sustain life above 4 percent on a U.S. 10-year. We'll see right now at 423, and we've had 10 consecutive days of closing above 4 percent on a 10-year yield. Let's turn to the FX market. The euro at the moment, just a little stronger against the dollar at 109.34. Jordan Rochester of Nomura was on the program with us in the last hour. Jordan was talking at 116 by year end on the euro. He's thrown the towel in on that. At least he's talking up the potential of maybe a drop to 105 on this disappointing data out of China. And plenty of reasons why the ECB have to do more, but also equally plenty of reasons why the ECB has to do less. A rock and a hard place for President Lagarde. Kit Jukes actually put it really well. Why isn't the euro lower, right? The fact that we're seeing euro strength on a day like today, when the European economy is that much more linked to China, is a head scratcher. And there is a real question of whether the ECB is going to uh, be able to hold rates where they are sooner, simply because there isn't the same kind of growth and inflation coming from China. It's your top story today. Under surveillance this morning, China's central bank unexpectedly cutting the rate on its one-year loans by the most since 2020. Economic activity in the country, not great. The U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen calling China's slowdown a, quote, risk factor for the U.S. economy. I actually think that comment right there, Lisa, is quite interesting. How much of a risk factor is it? Dan Solis was on the program with us just a moment. Dan Greenhouse of Solis Alternative Asset Management, who loved that new name, Dan Solis. Dan Greenhouse <laughs> was with us just moments ago. Dan said we'll be okay. 
that perhaps even, my word's not his, but I'm paraphrasing here, US economy can decouple in a way that things get dicey in China doesn't mean things are bad here in the US. Markets agree with him. And a lot of other people who have come on also agree with him, considering the fact that stocks have held in. We've known this for a while. This isn't new news. It's just the depth of how much the uh, economy there is decelerating is uh, perhaps a little bit deeper than people had expected. But we knew this. And the fact that yields are still higher in the US suggests that it's not going to materially diminish the inflation or growth pro uh, projections uh, that the US has. So again, are we dealing with decoupling? And is that part of what's underpinning some of the distortions that people are trying to explain in markets? That's the top story in the global economy. I'd argue this is the top story down in Washington at the moment. Donald Trump indicted in Atlanta over efforts to overturn his 2020 election defeat in Georgia. It's the fourth criminal case brought against the former president. In a statement, Trump's lawyers calling the indictment, quote, shocking and absurd. And this is just going to dominate things, not just for the next year, but particularly in the next week, Lisa, going into that first debate for Republicans. And it is going to be highly politicized. And it's a very difficult one to talk about because there are people on both sides who either think that, you know, this is either a long time coming or this is just another evidence of the witch hunt that Donald Trump talks about. So you have both of those polls and they're not getting closer to each other. And so how does this really shake out heading into a contentious election at a time where Donald Trump still is the front runner, still is the one who dominates really all of the races. Let's finish on the earnings this morning. Home Depot beating estimates this morning, giving insight into the US consumer. The company maintaining its fiscal 23 guidance, expecting comparable sales to decline as much as 5%. That's the story for them. The stock is down by about 0.2%. You'll hear from Target tomorrow, Walmart on Thursday, and in about 55 minutes from now, Lisa, we'll get that retail sales print for America. How much are we going to learn from it? Are people going to look past it? How many times have we gotten an economic data print and people say, OK, but it's distorted because this, this and this. But I still believe that X is going to happen. Haven't we seen that? It's data dependency with an asterisk, but we're depending on data that we haven't gotten yet. And I just feel like we're going to have that kind of discussion after this one, too. Last big data point ahead of Jackson Hole. Yeah. Next week. This is kind of it for Chairman Powell. Is he delivering a speech? We have that confirmed yet. I mean, I have not seen we're, confirmation, we're but we're expecting, we're expecting him to deliver him a speech. Too. And what I want to understand is where they see the neutral right now, where they see them going down to. I think the question now is not when they cut rates, is not whether they're going to raise rates another 25 basis points, but is it, are they going to see a three to three and a half percent kind of terminal Fed funds rate and how that really changes the equation. TK taking a bit of a break this morning to gear up for Jackson Hole coverage live from Wyoming about a week away. Joining us now, Blarini Ricci. Chief U.S. Economist at T. Rowe Price. Blarina, wonderful to catch up with you. Let's just talk about this. Just how resilient is this U.S. consumer? Well, I think we're going to see some confirmation in the data, uh, as you said, in 55 minutes with the retail sales telling us how well did the consumer do during Amazon Prime Day, how strong is consumer spending on goods, which really has been the very surprising resilience of this year. We all expected goods consumption to decelerate and services to take over. What happened was that both services and uh, goods has been strong. And I think that's related to the fact that the labor market market in the U.S. has held up pretty well. Even though in the last couple of reports we've seen employment growth slowing, the unemployment rate is really very low. Aggregate incomes are growing and we have inflation slowing, which is helping with real household disposable incomes as well. So when I'm looking at the next three to six months, I see some headwinds for the U.S. consumer for sure. Some of that is the fact that the excess savings buffer that was built during the pandemic is likely going to uh, be depleted by year end. Some of it is to do with the resumption of student debt repayments later this year. Uh, but nevertheless, I think there is enough support from the labor market to prevent the U.S. consumer from completely rolling over. We also know that the debt part of the U.S. consumer, their balance sheet is fairly healthy. And even though credit card balances have increased in recent months, they're increasing from low levels. And we know that the U.S. consumer still has room to leverage in order to smooth consumption over the coming months. We were talking earlier, Blarina, about sort of a rolling ball of money and this weird behavior after the pandemic where everyone just rushed out uh, and had a you only live w once kind of moment. They traveled. It was experiences. And then there was a question, OK, when will they be enough? They'll say enough with the airplanes, enough with traveling. 
and then they move somewhere else. Are we starting to see that? What else already? Are they starting to shift that allocation of their discretionable as discretionary spending to another area? So I think if you were to, if you wanted to look for signs of some softness in the. Uh, travel and hospitality sector, you could point to the recent softness or weakening in airfare prices. That could be a signal that demand there is not as strong as it used to be. But at this point in the business cycle, I don't think that there are many other areas where the consumer could go back and spend in force, especially because on big ticket items such as electronics and household items, they did spend already a lot during the pandemic. And we know we have a high housing market that even though it's stabilized recently, it's weaker and we're not seeing the same volume of homes being built and houses being set, uh, sold. So that means that the pipeline of purchases of big ticket items and electronics should be lower as well. OK, so in other words, if you sort of put this all together, it sounds like the consumer is hanging in there, isn't going to necessarily stop spending. There might be a little bit less than the immediate sort of gangbuster spending post pandemic. But we're looking at a scenario where that's not going to be what's going to break the economy, that that can hold in. Is that what you're saying? I think so. I think we need to be looking at what's going to cause the unemployment rate to increase. For that to happen, we need some firing to be in the pipeline in the, uh, in the private sector, in the corporate sector. And here, I think interest rates and the discussion you're having earlier about what is neutral and how long will interest rates be restrictive is very important. We need to look at the corporate sector and their balance sheet and how long can they sustain debt servicing costs at this level levels before profit margins really get squeezed. Because once that happens, that's going to be the time when they will not be able to hoard labor anymore. They'll start firing. And that's uh, what's going to be the trigger for the U.S. households and the U.S. consumer to cave in. Blarina, just quickly, Lisa and I were talking about the prospect of Chairman Powell speaking in Jackson Hole next week. It hasn't been confirmed yet, but most people expect it to happen. What would you expect to hear from him? What do you think the focus will be? So I think he will probably recognize some of the progress that we've made on inflation to date. And in the last couple of reports, there were signs for optimism there. But at the same time, be very cautious not to declare victory. There are reasons to be concerned about the how sustained this deceleration in inflation will be, because a lot of that has come from used car prices and airlines. Once those categories rebound, what's going to happen with the trend in inflation? And also, we're not getting an unequivocal uh, weakness in inflation message, because the PCE measure has been stickier. And we expect the PCE numbers for July to be stronger than the CPI inflation data. So I think he'll be balanced and not rule out the fact that they may need to do another interest rate increase this year. I know that for some that's beyond the point, but I think this is very important because we are not certain that the last hike is behind us. So I think it's premature then for uh, FOMC members to go out and already talk about cutting interest rates and how much and how soon we'll need to cut interest rates next year. So I think it will really come down to Powell to be uh, on message, to be balanced about the progress done so far, but the work that is still ahead of us, and then leave it to the data to do the heavy lifting. Of course, in inf if inflation decelerates much faster, then there there might be room um, to ease monetary policy later in 2024, but it's too soon to start planning for that yet. Valerina, I'll get your, your name out. Yurichi, thank you. <laughs> T. Rowe Price, forgive me. The US data, more of that a little bit later this morning. Retail sales, less of that, more data a little <laughs> bit later. US retail sales just around the corner. If you're just tuning in, welcome. Equity futures right now, negative by 0.7% on the S&P 500. Coming up a little bit later, U.S. retail sales. The focus of City Bank of America, Lisa, they do believe that we can get another rate hike from this Federal Reserve in the Jim Bianco camp that maybe inflation starts to pick up again. That's what we've seen in the data, right? I mean, honestly, people are looking at some of the core inflation. You start to see people talking about housing bottoming out, rent starting to pick back up in certain places. You start seeing all of these signs, and it points to that strength that Neil Dutta and Jim Bianco speak to. Other people say, just wait.
Just wait. That's going to come in. It's I'm so pleased that TK wasn't there for that. Coming up, Lindsay Piexa, Chief Economist at yeah, Steve Ford. He wouldn't have said her name. He would have just said... Brrr. No, no. He would have asked like, me yeah. to say it, and then I would have butchered it, and he would have said, great, well done, John. Yeah. Nice it, work. Well, you know, I that know. would be on him. TK, you missed. <laughs> you are missed. Hopefully see him later this week. Jeff Yu of BMY Mellon coming up shortly. We'll talk to him about the FX market. Also, some developments over in the United Kingdom. Record wage growth in the UK, just as people were hoping the Bank of England could back away and bring some life to the mortgage market for those of you looking to get on the housing market, the housing ladder, um, maybe the BOE comes back for more. 7.8% wage growth. That's without bonuses. That is shocking compared to the expectation of 7.4%. Fantastic if you're receiving it. You know, yeah. It's shocking if your goal is to get them down because you're worried about inflation. They just stop asking for wage increases. Yeah, that's a great message mm. to send to the British public and, well. and one that apparently isn't working either. From New York, this is Bloomberg. The administration remains committed to taking actions to lower prices for Americans where we can. And we continue to monitor, monitor developments, particularly those abroad, that may affect prices and growth. That was Secretary Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, speaking in Las Vegas with local union workers. Also mentioning, of course, Lisa, on China being a risk factor for the U.S. economy. The data out of China, not great overnight. So here is the sort of two poles of the discussion where people are saying the U.S. is decoupling from China and doesn't need to uh, necessarily worry too much about the slowdown there. And other people saying that's just not true, that these are two economies intricately uh, connected to one another. If that's the case, are we not pricing in that potential? Slow down. Well, I think we've got to be consistent. If you were super looking forward to and excited about the reopening, lifting US equity markets, which is some commentary we've received this morning, then you also have to believe simultaneously that if it doesn't impress, then that's a reason not to like US equity markets. The multinationals, they make up a big slice of the S&P 500. If we're talking about a slowdown in Europe, a slowdown in China, and an inability to respond to it, then it's going to affect some companies more than others. And I'm thinking about Apple, for example, in terms of manufacturing. I'm thinking about Tesla. We saw that with the price cuts in order to compete more effectively. And then the big industrials as well, Caterpillar, others. And they've talked about this. They're ratcheting down their sales expectations in China. Equities right now negative. This session lows, actually, were down by 0.7 percent on the S&P 500. Yields are higher by three basis points. 4.22.28. Talked a lot about the economic data still to come. U.S. retail sales a little bit later in the next hour, 8.30 Eastern Time. Jeff, you joins us now, senior market strategist at BNY Mellon. Jeff, wonderful to get you on the programme with us, particularly from the Morning. UK, so we can start in London with some record wage growth. Jeff, mm. just how tight is this labour market and how supply constrained is it going forward from here? Um, I don't think things are going to uh, get easier anytime soon. I mean, it's not just the one-offs you know, people are talking about. If you look at the uh, job creation over the last three months or so, you know, these are very, very strong um, gains. You know, what's interesting is you know, some of the services sectors um, in terms of uh, uh, outright job creation and uh, wage growth, the openings of growth, uh, that has softened. But other areas of the economy are still going strong. Uh, so uh, Governor Bailey, um, he's going to watch his language very carefully, of course, in terms of not asking for wage increases. Um, but I think the economy is moving on right now. Jeff, in the US, we're talking about things like soft landings, getting inflation down towards 2% without a recession. Do you think Governor Bailey and the Bank of England has that luxury? Can they get inflation back towards target without a recession? Uh, I don't think they're going to have to commit to anything at this point. My view is um, the last meeting they should have done 50 basis points. Uh, so you front load all the easing right now. And uh, to be frank, uh, I know it's a bit of a with benefit of hindsight, uh, but today's uh, data actually does justify that. I think they're going to have to have, have to keep going at 25 increments you know, until we get a clear glide path. But that's potentially 12 to 18 months away. How different is the situation in the UK where you are foreseeing future rate hikes and the ECB at a time when some people are gaming at the end of the rate hikes over there, especially in light of what we're seeing with China. Uh, so uh, the uh, Sintra speech uh, from Madame Lagarde, and she mentioned something about the eurozone economy and the labour market. But I think you can apply that to the UK as well. Uh, and uh, in uh, extremis, it's basically you are seeing a lot of wage growth, but from the non-productive sectors. The UK has a productivity puzzle. So you really you know, get kind of that stagflationary growth in the UK, and it's not going to help anytime soon. Now, with the eurozone, they are going to be worried about China manufacturing PMIs. They're going to continue to print awful, probably below 40. Uh, so that probably has a bit more of a disinflationary drag uh, on the eurozone. 
economy. So I think the eurozone can get to a soft landing, uh, but they're going to have to look closely at the manufacturing sector, not just in the short term, but with all the EV technology coming through, uh, the medium to longer term as well. Eurozone has to restructure. Hold on a second. This is actually really important, Jeff, because we've been hearing from the likes of Kit Jukes, who says that he's surprised the euro isn't weaker. A lot of people are asking the same question. You're saying that actually the disinflation from China could enable the soft landing in Europe that a lot of people thought was looking less likely than in the U.S. Is that correct? I do think so, right, because what you have is um, with manufacturing jobs, these are high value added jobs uh, which are being lost um, right now. The multiplier effect comes through in time. You're going to see high value added jobs decline and that will affect uh, growth in the services side uh, because those who can spend, if they can't spend any more, uh, then I think services demand will come off as well. So that glide path um, is in place and trend growth is lower in the eurozone as well. But that's just in the short term. In the medium to longer term, once we get inflation back to target, where is the eurozone growth strategy uh, from here? It's especially with the onslaught of um, EV uh, into Europe from China. I think that is a 5, 10, 25-year conversation that needs to be had in Europe right now. Jeff, let's talk about the growth strategy out of China. I've shared some commentary a few times this morning from Standard Chartered. They called the cut from the central bank aggressive, from SOCGEN, unlikely to be the last measure. Jeff, most people assume this was insufficient. If there's more to come, what is there to come? Shall we have a conversation about quantitative easing by the People's Bank of China, right? And we're talking large volumes here. What if you do get quantitative easing out of China to the extent that it can start to offset some of the balance sheet contraction, the QT in the Fed and uh, ECB, right? That changes global liquidity dynamics materially. There are legal constraints around this, I think. Um, but if we go towards the end of last year, the PBOC did fully subscribe to a bond rollover, 750 billion RMB at that point. It is doable. It doesn't have to be a plan program. So I'm not saying uh, that is not my base case, you know, just to be clear, but all options need to be on the table right now. Fiscal in concert with monetary, that comprehensive approach is needed from China right now. It's already getting quite late in the year, even in the fiscal year. So we do expect more. Um, but the later they uh, put um, in terms of policy, probably the stronger it's going to have to be. Jeff, do you believe things are that bad at the moment over there? Uh, well, if you just um, you know, look at uh, the uh, loan um, figures, right, and I do know if you uh, uh, go back to uh, the previous um, premier, uh, Li Keqiang, there was a Li Keqiang index, right? It is available on um, Bloomberg. Uh, uh, and uh, he looked at short-term indicators and loan growth was part of that. Power generation, you know, freight, uh, everything put together. You're not seeing the seasonal recovery uh, that we anticipated uh, in the past. Um, so the thing is, do you want to wait until things are that bad and then find out it's too late? Because you're always going to have to play catch-up. Uh, so going back to my earlier point. Uh, right now, it's already quite late in the year. You need to front load the stimulus in the same way the BOE needs to front load or needed to front load a bit of their rate hikes. Jeff, a lot of people are saying that the fact that the Communist Party has not done more indicates a lack of willingness to go as far as you were talking about with some sort of massive quantitative easing program. Mm -hmm. Do you agree or do you think that it's premature to write off something more substantial? Uh, so I think uh, any QE program, you know, from the PBOC or anything along those lines, um, I think it's very easy to draw an equivalence with what happened in 2009, the a big loan um, program. That is very, very different. So the transmission of QE, the central bank you know, buys government bonds, and then you lower real rates. China needs to lower real rates, you know, right now. Uh, so I think that's why they're allowing, within reason, the uh, renminbi to uh, depreciate because that imports some um, some uh, inflation. So it's uh, so yes, the Ministry of Finance is worried about um, and the PBOC about a debt issue building up five to 10 years from now, but they need to do something that is different to 2009 and in size to basically lift sentiment targeting the consumer. They've absolutely said the right things over the past month or so, but now really is to put everything in effect, focus on real rates. They need to do whatever it takes to get those things down. Hey, Jeff, thank you. Jeff, you there of BNY Mellon. Quite a moment today. Dollar C and H through 7.30. Lisa on that currency pair. Weaker Chinese currency off the back of these rate cuts and some difficult economic data out of the world's second largest economy. And Jeff saying that that's OK with them because it might import some inflation. Again, this just sort of points to how strange uh, this moment is with such a fracturing of the major global economies with the U.S. and Europe fighting inflation and China facing deflation or disinflation in a massive way. This is a real concern given uh, that this was an engine of growth for so many years. Well, at least complementary in one way, because the United States would like to import some disinflation too, right? So it works both ways. It does work both ways. But I, again, I think that you asked the right question, John, which is how divorced is the U.S. economy truly from China? 
where are the interconnected, where is the inter interconnectedness, not only of Europe uh, and China, but also the US? And I don't think we fully understand that. Well, there's two ways of framing that question, and you only have to change a couple of words for it to have a very different meaning, a different answer. How divorced is the US economy? How divorced the US markets? Because that's a very different question in many ways. You can make the argument we're less dependent on US imports of, of Chinese goods. We can see that in the data, but is the market, the equity market, the benchmark, the weightings of some of these multinationals less exposed to what's happening in Europe, in China, and worldwide? And if you think about the real estate market, how many Chinese investors came into US real estate uh, to buy up buildings that may not be there quite to the same degree? There is this question of how much is that part of what's underpinning some of the move in yields, the lack of Chinese, the lack of Japanese. Japanese buyers. The conversation continues with Bob Dole of Crossmark. He joins us in the studio in about five minutes time. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. think we're missing in order to get bigger trends is a bit of global divergence. The longer the imbalances persist, the worse the recession will be. I do think to some degree we're out of the zero rate environment that we have been. To me, the risk to inflation is three, six months, it starts speaking back up. What we really need in order for some of the slowdown to materialize is to see monetary policy that's somewhat a little more restrictive. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Retail sales in America, 30 minutes away. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 right now, session lows down by 0.7%. More weak data out of China, a rate cut from the Chinese central bank in the mix. Insufficient to put a floor under risk sentiment, risk appetite worldwide at the moment. There is a real concern about what's developing, Lisa, in the world's second largest economy and an inability may be for the Chinese policymaker at this point to do anything about it. Inability or unwillingness, right? And that's sort of the key question that a lot of people have. The fact that there hasn't been a greater noise or a greater move to date uh, or move that would actually comprehensively uh, target the source of the weakness, which is consumers aren't spending and the housing market needs to be uh, corrected, has left people thinking that maybe it's just not going to come this time. Equity session lows. Bond yields near session highs. Stateside, our focus shifts. 29 minutes away from retail sales in America. It's all about the U.S. consumer this week. And this is against the backdrop where Treasuries are selling off, yields are higher. The Federal Reserve is engaging in this happy talk about a soft landing and maybe even rate cuts next year. And here we are with the long end of the Treasury market selling off over the last month. The highest of the year, going back uh, potentially to before the pandemic, before the financial crisis, if you take a look just a couple more basis points away from the high in this particular cycle, we're looking at a time where people are resetting and saying the Fed's going to hold rates longer, uh, higher for longer, because there has been this resilience. And that subtle shift of not cutting rates next year as quickly as they previously thought is a game changer for investment theses that's just starting to work its way out in terms of what we're seeing in the prices. Let's go through the Canada together. So today, retail sales in about 28 minutes. Tomorrow, earnings from Target. Then on to Thursday, numbers from Walmart. And Lisa, in between, we get the Federal Reserve minutes. The Fed minutes, is that a platform for the Hawks, for the Doves? What's the balance of risk around doing too much, doing too little? That's clearly shifted in the last 12 months since the last Jackson Hole meeting. I couldn't agree more. There's a feeling of leaning into the hope of a soft landing, not wanting to disrupt it, of the hold. And why not hold rates and just wait? What are they waiting for? And this is really the question that we have to ask, which is how long do they have before they miss the boat in terms of being sufficiently restrictive or easing, right? Where is the balance of risks in terms of where inflation goes if it reaccelerates or if it's going to come down really dramatically. In other words, is there a window to deal with this before it becomes embedded? Do you have to tackle with it more quickly? Well said. <laughs> Thank well, I'm just you. trying to build on it. And That's I'm thinking well at the same time yeah. as I'm saying it, I'm thinking of the UK because wage growth in the UK today, just phenomenal. Record wage growth. What was it? A seven handle? 7.8%. Yeah. It's amazing. We're talking about the Bank of England back in a way, and they've got wage growth of seven plus percent in the United Kingdom. But it's well said about embedded and the sort of odd confluence of, of things. Yesterday, the New York Fed put out their inflation expectations survey, and it actually showed them coming down. So on one hand, and you saw that in the University of Michigan sentiment survey as well, inflation expectations 
are contained for now, but if people keep getting wage increases, if they keep spending, if they keep seeing the strength, at what point does it normalize some of the price instability that we've gotten used to? They'll tell the University of Michigan all about it, and you'll see it in their survey. You could too, if you, you get calls. You could too, if you get the call. I, mm. I want the call. Equities right now on the S&P, deeply negative by three quarters of 1%. We're near session lows here on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields are higher by four basis points. Talked a lot about that 423 level. Crude back in a way. Against the grain of the last month or so, though, Lisa, crude still above 80, 81.39. We're down here by a little more than 1%. And a risk factor, considering the fact that that was one of the tailwinds for certainly the European region, but also the U.S., is there the ammunition to fight it? Crude, to me, is one of the big stories, especially because how many people have come on and said that's the story they're leaning into? They're buying energy stocks. That's the sector that's yeah. going to do well. Can it continue to do well with China in the situation that it is? And then what does that mean for inflation? The crude's in the 80s. We're talking about a growth slowdown and rate cuts in China. And how much is this just supply, the fact that Saudi Arabia is cutting versus everyone's still flying around? Everyone's still, you know, going around their Hummer. Their Hummer. Yeah, even, you know, oh, maybe right. it's electric, but, you know, either They're way. expensive. They Hummers? Are. Yeah. Have you looked into one? No, the EV version of it oh. is expensive. Yeah, it yeah. costs a lot of money. Well, so does the non-EV Well, they cost a lot of money to run. Yeah. I know. <laughs> all of it. Bob Dole's with us now. Let's talk about markets. CIO of Crossmark Global Investments. Bob, good morning to you. Same. Let's talk about retail sales, 25 minutes away. Are we going to see that resilience in this U.S. economy, this U.S. consumer, in the data we're set to see in this hour? You just put a lot of good things, the two of you, on the table. A soft landing is like putting a thread into the needle, and the eye of that needle is shrinking. It's getting tougher and tougher. The consumer eventually will come to their knees. Um, we always see it at the low end. We all, all we see it with credit extension. Um, we, we see it. Um, wage growth is strong. How long will it stay strong? Um, and that has just fueled the consumer and it's fueled our economy and this thing has kept on going despite all the things in the background that you just put on the table, including the lagged effects of the Fed going from zero to five and a quarter. We have not felt all of that yet. Let's unpack that. It will happen eventually. Are we seeing signs of it now? You mentioned credit. You can see it through credit, maybe one way. Another way might be to see it in the official data. We'll see that at the bottom of the hour, 8.30. Another way might be the earnings. Across those three things right now, credit, data, earnings, are you seeing a slowdown? Not really. It's all lead indicators. The coincident indicators are, are positive. Some of them are getting a little mixed. It's going to take some more time to go there. We've been since the first of the year uh, saying recession starts sometimes between Labor Day and the end of the year. Still sticking with that. Think it's a mild recession, as many do, although recessions left most people's vocabulary, as you know. But, but where does that recession come from if you do see the strength in consumers? And a lot of people have pointed to the student loan issue. And I was reading this article, this survey by Credit Karma, and it was showing that 45 percent of student loan borrowers say that they are not going to repay. They're basically going to be delinquent for 12 months because they're not going to get penalized for being delinquent for 12 months. So aren't we basically getting a self-stimulus ongoing that will remain in place for a while? Well, it's it's been the story, um, and it's lasted a little longer than many people thought, and it's still not finished. But eventually, consumers will come to the realization that things are a lot more expensive, inflation's still a problem, they have no savings at the lower end of the consumer bracket, and that's a problem and they're going to have to retrench some or find a second job, and they've already done that. What's the hedge? What's the defensive play at a time when a lot of the strongest companies have incredibly high multiples, and you're looking at bond yields that are not giving a consistent message? Yeah, I, I think that within the equity market, you try to focus on companies that have high earnings predictability, high earnings persistence, and are not selling at crazy prices. And that's not a whole lot of places. I like the HMOs, for example. I've not given up on tech, but I, I want to be careful what PE I'm paying for my tech. So some of the semiconductor stocks, uh, some of the software stocks, um, they're not so cheap. Visa and MasterCard, two names I still like. They've gotten more expensive. Uh, so you have to pick your spots, and I come back to earnings persistence and cash flow generation. Let's talk about the retailers then. I'm Depot at this morning, Walmart later this week, Thursday, Target tomorrow. Have they still got that pricing power? Can they keep margins pretty steady, or do those margins get eaten away at? Eventually, and I think we'll see some of that, like now, uh, those margins get, get eaten away. Because, you see, 
companies can only raise prices so far, and you're already seeing consumers begin to make noise and balk and stop buying some things. It, it won't it won't be everything, but slowly but surely you take the edge off. We have to operate on eight cylinders to keep the thing where it is now. And even we back off to six, that's going to disappoint a lot of people with stock selling where they are. They're well, let's highlight the winners. Expensive. Forget tech. Cruise lines, airlines. Are we at that point where we've reached consumer price intolerance? They just don't want to pay it anymore. Well, as you said a minute ago, people are flying around. We were going on an airplane and, you know, every seat's taken. So we're not there yet, but we'll get there. Okay, so what's going to get us there? Because everyone's been saying this, that the consumer eventually will push back, and then they haven't. And then you go out to eat, and it costs twice what it used to. I mean, honestly, this is the kind of increases that you're seeing. Yeah, so it was subtle. We had 15 months in a row of better-than-expected monthly employment numbers. The last two months have been below expectations. So there are cracks beginning to develop. I don't want to come across as the economy's tanking and, and, and over, you know, want to be a bear overall. I'm just cautious. And I add to it, I said, all right, I'll say it again. If the PE were 14, different story. But you know, at the peak a couple of weeks ago, I looked at my screen on trailing er earnings, 23 times earnings. When you talk about being cautious, what's the ballast? If you, you talked about your equities, is it cash? Is it going into duration? <clears throat> I, I think having some cash in your portfolio when it yields 5% is not a stupid idea. Have you been increasing it? Uh, in, in the balanced accounts where we can, in the uh, equity market neutral portfolios, we've been bringing our ex exposure down and therefore our cash exposure up, yes. Bonds, yeah, own some bonds. I, I, I'm not sure that we've seen the high end yields yet, but I'd rather begin to nibble at, you know, four and a quarter than three and a half where we were not that long ago. But you think start to go out along the curve, start locking some of this stuff in? Slowly but surely, yes. Heard the same thing from Lisa Shannon over at Morgan Stanley. I mean, you think we face that reinvestment risk, rate cuts on the horizon? That will happen at some point, so I don't want all my eggs in the short term 5% basket. Um, look, a year ago, 18 months ago, one and a half percent 10 year treasury, that was a bad deal. Four and a quarter, mm, I think I'll think about it. It's unthinkable, isn't it? It wasn't that long ago. No. It wasn't that and long ago. And it happened ago. fast. I know, it really did, Bob. It's happening fast now. Bob, it's good to see you. Thank All you, sir. Thank you. Bob Dole of Crossmark Global Investments. This sell-off's happened quickly. The last month in the Treasury market, we thought we'd seen the highs back in October. That was it, 4.30. I think there was a feeling we'd seen the post-SVB failure highs of 4.20. And here we are doing it all over again in the last month. You know what makes me a little sad? What's that? That you can't buy the actual bond and get the certificate and then, you know, show your kids and say, like, this is a bond. And when it comes due, you get this amount. Is that what you'd like to do? Well, <laughs> I kind of. I think it's, I think, I don't know, my grandfather did that. And okay. I remember when they came due and we kind of have gotten away from that. And, Are the Bramo you know, kids learning about about bonds already? Are they oh, doing fixed income? They've been learning okay. about it since, you know, kindergarten. Since they're like... Eight. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Before that, we oh, had really? lots of discussions. Really? We have really fun, you know. Oh, it sounds sounds so fun, <laughs> so fun. If you're just tuning in, welcome on the S and P 500 <laughs> right now. Negative 0.7 percent. Summer at Casa Bramo. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you no imagine? Joke. Okay, true story. Go My on. son is actually taking a finance class this week. Um, well, he wants you know. to invest, right? Yeah, yeah, he's really interested in that. Are you so. letting him invest? Well, it's very tricky because I don't want it there to be conflict of interest, so I want him to do it virtually. Well, you don't. he doesn't have to tell you what he's investing in. He know, can talk about still, broad asset you know, classes. But, either, right? but he's actually really, he said to me last night, he's like, Mom, you know, I'm learning about this, and I think the Fed should just hold. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, I'm not oh, having this at home. And how old's, how old's <laughs> exactly. this one? <laughs> what, he's, he's 14. 14 yeah, with a yeah. view on the Fed. Well, he was, awesome. he was he thought it was really interesting. It is interesting. I mean, this is what everybody's talking about. Did you about. tell him he's very consensus? Did you tell him that? <laughs> yes. He might be upset about that. I told him. I said, you know, the, the extremes on either side, you know, and I, I was starting to explain it. And then mm. I, I went to sleep instead. All oh, right. And mm. you can teach him about QE and why they killed capitalism and all of that at a later date. Basically, you don't want to be my child. That's essentially <laughs> what you're learning today. And that my household is um, incredibly nerdy. That sounds great. 8.30, <laughs> so 17 minutes away. Resale sales data in America. Lindsay Piexa of Stiefel is going to join us to break down some of that data going into Jackson Hole next week. It's only a week or so away. Most people expecting Chairman Powell to say something about something. We just don't know what that something is. We're well, expecting him to talk, Bramo. I guess we're expecting him to talk, and a lot of people are saying that the, uh, the, the best case scenario for him is just to say as little as possible. I agree. I agree. I'm so on that page. I mean, what's You start why? entertaining rate cuts because you want to keep 
real rates steady, you don't want policy to get too restrictive. You send a signal doing that, that sends a signal. If he leans into the market action, saying the market has it about right that we're not gonna cut rates, that could actually have an impact on risk assets. Okay. Jackson Hole, we're gonna a be week there, away. So. We'll be there. Terry Haynes of Pangea, up next. alleges that rather than abide, abide by Georgia's legal process for election challenges, the defendants engaged in a criminal racketeering enterprise to overturn Georgia's presidential election result. I am giving the defendants the opportunity to voluntarily surrender no later than noon on Friday, the 25th day of August, 2023. It's about a week away, 10 days away. That was Farney Willis there, the district attorney of Fulton County, Georgia, laying out the indictment against the former president, Donald Trump, and 18 others over efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election in the state. In a statement, Trump's attorneys calling the charges both shocking and absurd. Lisa, make it number four. Yeah, and at a time when people are wondering how this will play into the election, just to note, this could be the first trial to be televised, and that's important at a time when televised events have benefited Donald Trump in the polls. Typically, uh, we've been talking about how press is often good in terms of facial recognition, and whether that will continue will be an interesting question. I think we can all agree on one thing. It's in the public interest to see some of this. And in Georgia, they have a rule allowing uh, television uh, televisation of some of these court cases. So people are speculating this may be the first to really be aired in real time. Watch this space. Watch this space. We've had some great guests this morning already. Bob Dole of Crossmark just moments ago. On the way out of the studio, he said this. He left us with this. And he said I could share it with you, so I will. He said 4,200 before 4,600 on the S&P 500. 4,200 before 4,600. Right now, equities are weaker. Let's whip through the price action together. We're about 12 minutes away from retail sales in America. Equity futures are negative by 0.65%, just about off session lows. A lot of attention on the bond market for good reason. The sell-off continues. Treasuries down, yields higher by four basis points. Lisa, it's 423 on a 10-year. This, to me, is the story of the past few weeks, the grind higher and what's behind it. And you ask five people, you will get five different answers. But the bottom line is, for all the people who say they're leading into duration, it isn't affecting the duration in terms of price and yield. Lock it in. Bob talked about locking it in. I saw the same in a note from Lisa Shallot over at Morgan Stanley as well, the and reinvestment I risk of, sure, that one-year T-bill, whatever it might be, feels good right now. But what if that matures and they're cutting rates and you've missed the opportunity to, to lock some of this in. We've heard that from Morgan Stanley. We've heard that from J.P. Morgan. Yep. We've heard that from Western uh, Asset Management. We've heard that uh, from a whole host of others, including HSBC this morning. Again, we hear this. Where are the mass buyers? You know, when they step <laughs> in, then yields will come in. Not yet. Retail sales. 11 minutes away. Joining us now on Washington and the latest developments down in Georgia, Terry Haynes, founder of Pangea Policy. Terry, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Always thoughtful, our conversations together. We mentioned this in the last couple of hours, and I think it's the appropriate place to start. We've got cases now in New York, in Washington, D.C., in Florida, in Georgia. Terry, how do you rank those just in terms of importance? Oh, importance. Uh, I think it's far too early to tell uh, for one reason that you and Lisa were just talking about, which is the timing of the cases. Um, you know, there's a whole there's a lot of different ways you can slice these things. Federal versus state racketeering versus uh, 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 conspirators, all kinds of things. Uh, I'd rank them in, in order of how they're actually going to come to trial. <clears throat> and to some extent, excuse me. And to some extent, it matters greatly, uh, you know, frankly, I think, whether they're televised or not, as, as you say. I mean, the closer uh, people see what's actually going on and why, uh, they're going to have more of an opportunity uh, to make up their minds on it. Terry, can you elaborate a little bit? Why is the televisation of this important? You said to make up their minds. But what do you think the outcome will be of having it very much in the public eye? I think there's just an immediacy to, to television, frankly, and, uh, you know, I think we've seen that over the past uh, 60, 70 years, just in terms of how people perceive candidates and people choose candidates. So, you know, very broadly, there's that. Uh, but secondly, there is a 
uh, debate, more than a debate in the country, about whether this is uh, politicized prosecution uh, or whether there's something here. So uh, there's going to be a, an awful lot of pressure on the Fulton County DA to show that these charges are real and they're not the kind of standard splash that prosecutors do. You know, prosecutors uh, tend to go, you know, go in front of grand juries, particularly. You go big, you go broad, you get the maximum you can from the grand jury. Uh, in this case, it's going to be, you know, uh, did she overstep? Does she actually have uh, evidence? Uh, and, you know, and of course, the other side has a great deal to say about how to interpret the evidence. Uh, so, you know, this is going to be on a pretty big stage uh, and uh, even more so if it's the first one. Terry, there's a real question around the different poles of the political sphere right now and how people are going to respond to court cases that most of America or many of Americans have already decided about, regardless of what's happened yet. What do you think the outcome will be to some sort of conclusion of the trial if there is some sort of conviction? I mean, I'm just trying to play out the political risks here on a social level. Well, I think firstly, and I've said this to you all before, I think there is greater uncertainty around the 2024 presidential election because uh, you have uh, increased risk for an uncertainty about Trump and about Biden. Uh, on on Trump specifically, I think what you've got is a situation where, you know, if there's a conviction, uh, my instinct is what happens is that it accelerates this death by a thousand paper cuts process where people say, you know what, uh, regardless of Trump policies, regardless of whatever, you know, uh, movement, you know, kind of anti-establishment movement, I think exists here. Uh, it's I'd be better off with another candidate. So I tend to think the the more the prosecutions uh, start landing home, uh, the the more that the Republican electorate turns elsewhere. Right now, Terry, as you game out that political risk and you talk to different clients, what are you telling them to prepare for? What is the way that it will manifest itself if we're not focused as much on, say, debt reduction or some of the tangibles, nuts and bolts of fiscal governance? Well, I say, I say a couple of things. One is that the, uh, the, the first action in the presidential uh, primary process is five months, I think, from today. I mean, I, you know, Iowa, I think, is five months from today. So... Uh, you know, that's a very long time in politics, and there are examples all over the board about how, uh, you know, somebody that was leading in the polls today, you know, didn't win uh, different primary challenges. Uh, so, you know, number one, there's that. Number two, keep your eye on the panoply of things that are going on in Washington. Uh, you know, not just the Trump uh, matter or the Biden matter. You've got just in the next few months, you've got a, uh, the, I think, a shutdown likelihood, a government shutdown likelihood at 60 percent. Uh, you've got uh, probably no meaningful action on debt and fiscal, which uh, markets are increasingly interested in. Uh, you've got everything from the China economy to the Ukraine-Russia matter to uh, to think about, uh, you know, bank capital standards and all the way down to John's favorite topic, UFOs. So, uh, <laughs> you know, what we've got is a situation here where there's an awful lot of risk coming out of Washington on a variety of fronts all at once. And it be would behooves investors to pay attention to all of it, not just uh, this particular bread and circus. Terry, how did you know that? How did you know that? Terry, how real is this oh down God. in D.C. when you watch these hearings? How real is it? Which part? The UFO the UFOs, part? obviously, Terry. <laughs> I, I, you know, the, the, the cheap and easy line is to say anybody that watches Washington uh, with regularity, uh, you know, uh, does believe in, uh, you know, the, the, that there's something out there that, it, you know, is affecting things <laughs> that isn't us. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think there's an awful lot of circumstantial evidence on the UFO matter, as there always has been. And, uh, the, you know, they're going to need to get to the next step to start convincing people. Terry, thank you, sir. Terry Haynes. Of Pangea policy down in Washington. It's Every, fascinating to watch. Everybody knows that you love you. I probably said it. Probably said it yeah. on air. Did you see that Paul Krugman? I mean, love is, <laughs> love is strong. Love is strong. But I'm you just care about them. And increasingly you in them. aware and interested yes. in. Well, I will just say this um, on Odd Lots of Bloomberg, Paul Krugman was on there talking about UFOs. What did he say? He said that um, alien invasions are inflationary. Okay. So, that's so we can expect the... them to be deflationary, right? <laughs> Wow, that's harsh. Isn't that what we do? I thought that was the game. <laughs> Krugman says, and you know. No? Okay. He actually just wrote a column about how he, he you know, is talking about how he's gotten things wrong. Look, all I can say is, you know, the fact that we're talking about UFOs more than debt reduction. 
gets well, you we're in not. A sense. We just did, just you know, indulge me. We just did sixty Honestly, seconds. That's you know, all. And actually, people do see unidentified flying objects a lot. Yeah, I know. But do you actually think they're like little green creatures inside, being like, ooh? No one said anything about that. <laughs> okay. Just... Did I make noises? No, I didn't. Retail sales five minutes away from New York. This is Bloomberg. US retail sales, that data, seconds away. Going into it, the scores look like this on the S&P 500. Equity futures near session lows and down about 0.6%. In the bond market, 10 seconds ahead of the data, Treasury selling off once again. Yields are higher on a 10-year by three or four basis points. 423 is the yield on a US 10-year at the moment. We're at a new high for 2023. The economic data in America just about to drop across the Bloomberg. We'll do this three different ways. Let's start with the headline number. Uh, retail sales upside surprise wow. across the board here, 0.7% against an estimate of 0.4. You can strip out autos, you can strip out gas. The numbers look like this, positive 1%. The survey, positive 0.4. If you look at the control group, that number, of course, goes into GDP. That is an upside surprise as well at 1%. The estimate there, 0.5. So it's an upside surprise across the board here for U.S. retail sales. In the bond market, guess what is happening? Yields are up here by seven basis points on a 10-year to 426, getting very close to a cycle high for a 10-year yield. In the equity market, breaking down towards session lows, we're down by 0.7%. Lisa, that's an upside surprise. Again, at a time when people were expecting there to be a little bit of bite with people not necessarily having the savings, we're looking right now. Uh, I'm just watching that two-year yield climb past 5%. We're now gaming out a 5% yield for two years, and the length of that is really what's catching my attention over the, in the currency space, well, that euro strength fades. And we can see a 109, uh, 1089. We actually broke out of the 109 version as dollar uh, really does become ascendant. If you bring up an intraday chart of the euro on your screen at home, just take a look. It's literally just like that, down bank. The euro negative on the session now. It was positive, a break of 109 briefly. But that's upside surprise again for US retail sales. And that goes in. This is the last big data point before Jackson Hole next week, Elisa. The consumer, based on retail sales, I know, and we can break down what's happening beneath the surface, still looking pretty resilient. Inflation, some people still arguing, is bottoming here and may well pick up through the year. And this bond market is not smelling the end of a rate hiking cycle of the two years back through 5%, is it? No. And if it is seeing the end of the actual hiking cycle, it's seeing the uh, simply the constancy of a rate that's held at that level, not necessarily rate cuts. It's not just the upside surprise. It's the nature of the upside surprise. The control group, which you pointed to, John, which does go into GDP, came in at 1% month over month versus the estimate of 0.5%, up from 0.5% the prior month, which was revised lower by a tenth of a percent. This is a massive upside surprise, especially on month over month at a time when, when consumers were supposed to be running out of gas in their tank. So let me go through this again, if you are just tuning in. Upside surprise, 0.7% headline retail sales for the month of July. That's month over month. The number we were looking for in the survey, 0.4. Strip out autos and gas, that number is 1% against an estimate of 0.4. And the control group, the so-called control group, that's the number that goes into GDP, 1% against an estimate of 0.5. Equities still lower, treasuries lower too. Yields elevated right the way through the curve, as Lisa mentioned the two-year through 5%, the 10-year at 426. In the FX market, a stronger dollar, a weaker euro. Euro dollar right now, 109. Coming up on the program in the next hour to break this down, Amanda Lynham of BlackRock, Michael Kushmer of Morgan Stanley, Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genity. Lisa, all of that still to come on Bloomberg TV. Fascinating conversations at a time where it does seem like everyone's looking at the potential for some sort of sea change, some sort of shift. And it happens to be in the wrong direction, at least for the bond market and equity market. As we work through some of these numbers, you have to wonder at what point does the consumer stop fueling an economic recovery that has lasted longer and been more robust than almost anyone had expected. Lindsay Piegza, someone who has been calling for rates to be much higher, potentially even with a six handle for the Federal Reserve to get inflation under control, uh, joins us right now. She is a chief economist at Stiefel. Lindsay, what's your view on why we saw such a big upside surprise on retail sales? 
Well, this certainly was a stronger than expected report, and no doubt this will boost optimism that because of the resilience of the consumer, we can achieve that soft landing. But I, I would push back a little bit in the sense that we don't need to put too much focus on one month's numbers. What we have seen is a tremendous amount of volatility in terms of consumer activity month to month, suggesting that, yes, while this was a welcome step in the right direction, consumers are increasingly shifting the goods and services in their basket on a month-to-month -month basis, something that they do, something we do as consumers when we are increasingly concerned about our financial footing. So while this is, again, beating the expectations for the market, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is a trend that can continue to rise, particularly against the backdrop of some of these factors that prove uh, artificial support, drawing down savings, a uh, last sputtering of state and local stimulus. We see hardship withdrawals from, war from 401ks up over 40 percent on a year-over-year -year basis. But while this will provide a temporary support, this is not an indefinite support to the consumer. So where does this fit in, Lindsay, to your view uh, that you previously had, that the Fed had a lot more work to do, that they had to get to a level that nobody was gaming out, or very few, of 6 percent or north of that. Well, I think this is going to make the, the Fed's job more difficult because the longer it takes for the labor market, for the consumer to show that needed weakness or respond to earlier policy tightening, the more aggressive the response from the Fed must be, thus ensuring an eventual downturn. So the notion that the fact that consumer has continued to be resilient across the first 525 basis points, supporting the notion of a soft landing, no, I would argue it's quite the opposite. That simply means the Fed will have to be more aggressive, raising rates higher and keeping rates higher for longer than investors had anticipated, suggesting that the downturn potentially and eventually will come and may be more uh, more aggressive, more, more uh, of a downturn than previously anticipated if the Fed didn't need to raise rates quite as much Lindsay, to squash out inflation. Lindsay, you said two things, raise rates higher and keep them there for longer. And those are, were the ideas that people had. But some people are starting to think, OK, what if the Fed is done with how high they're going to uh, raise rates, but they are going to keep them there for longer? And that's what we're seeing priced into the market gradually with some of the highest longer term expectations for Fed funds rates that we've seen in this cycle. At what point does that cause more damage in your view? Well, I, I think it's certainly going to cause more damage, again, the more pressure on the Fed to respond. Now, if we continue to see this type of resilience, uh, if we continue to see th uh, third quarter GDP surpass uh, earlier expectations or surpass what we saw in the second quarter, I, I think the Fed doesn't necessarily need to continue to raise rates indefinitely. But once they reach that sufficiently restrictive level, as you mentioned, we've long uh, conceded that will be uh, 6 percent or above, the Fed is likely going to be forced to keep us at that at elevated level for some time. The Fed itself has said rate cuts are not in their base case scenario for 2023, but even 2024 remains a sizable question mark if we aren't able to see that intended result. Remember, the Fed is raising rates to tap down consumption, tap down investment, and result in a slower level of activity in order to get that more benign inflation. But thus far, the economy is pushing very hard against the intentions of tighter monetary policy. If you are just joining us, we are just uh, seeing the ramifications of retail sales numbers that came in significantly higher than expected. We're seeing the overall month over month headline number of 0.7 percent versus expectations of 0.4 percent. The control group, which does factor into the U.S. gross domestic product figure, came in at 1 percent from the expected 0.5 percent. We are seeing two year uh, yields surge past 5 percent, 10 year yields and 30 year yields, both reaching the highest level since October, climbing up. Uh, we're seeing 30-year yields 4.32 percent. Lindsay Piegza of Stiefel with us. And Lindsay, I, I really want to get your sense of what could potentially halt this spending. You were saying it can't persist. You're not going to see this forever. Some people have pointed to the student loan repayments that are going to restart in October. Do you give credence to this sort of idea that we could see some sort of tightening and, and fiscal tightening on that front going forward? 
Oh, absolutely. There's a number of factors. And remember, even with this monthly increase uh, beating expectations, when we take a step back and look at the longer term momentum, it's very clear that consumers are beginning to slow their activity. Coming out of the gate from the great uh, the shutdown, we had a double digit growth. Then we slowed to eight, six. Now we're talking about bouncing around 2% on an annual basis. So while still positive, the consumer has clearly pulled back. And these other factors, as you mentioned, monthly payments for student loans, additional housing payments, payments coming back online. This is going to compound the pressure on the consumer. Now, there are some temporary supports that we're still tapping into. There still is a sputtering of state and local stimulus. Consumers are turning to 401ks. Consumers are ramping up credit card debt. And with the relative health of the balance sheet, meaning we paid down debt during the closure, during the pandemic, there still is some wiggle room for the consumer to expand that balance sheet. So I'm certainly not suggesting that the consumer is going to immediately fall off a cliff. But what we are seeing is these indefinite supports beginning to wane, putting additional pressure on the consumer eventually as we head further into the second half of the year. What do you expect Jay Powell to say in Jackson Hole next week, given all of this? Well I think one of the biggest questions that investors have is for how long? And that's really what I think Chair Powell is going to focus on. It's not necessarily how high, because it seems as if the committee is of one mind that we're nearing that terminal level. Whether it's one, two, maybe even three additional rate hikes, we're up near that that sufficiently restrictive level. But how long will the Fed need to raise rate or keep rates, excuse me, at that elevated level? I also think he's going to talk about the context of inflation against monetary policy. How does the Fed respond if we see a reversal in inflationary pressures? Is that even a scenario that the Fed is considering? And how does the committee balance the risk between raising rates even higher than previously expected, slowing the economy against the risk of, of wanting to obtain that 2% inflation target? So there's a lot of questions that investors are going to be listening for, that I'm going to be listening for, in terms of how to gauge the Fed's mindset on these broader uh, broader themes for inflation and monetary policy. Lindsay Piegza of Stiefel. And as we're speaking right now, you are seeing uh, that two-year yield just bump up against that 5% level, trying to see how long it can hold on. Just to, to take a look at the market reaction, it is as you would expect. She's trying to game out how high the Fed has to hike rates, but more importantly, for how long. And that does seem to be the tone across the board, watching the dollar space, because that has been one of the big surprises, that there was uh, dollar weakness versus the euro, even in light of what we saw over in China. We now see that reassert itself. It actually has reversed after the knee-jerk uh, response, where now it's 109.17, a little bit of euro strength versus the dollar. We should all just also just mention in the slew of debt data that came out, we got Empire Manufacturing data for the month of August to read on manufacturing, and it came in with a downside surprise of negative 19. So there is this question around whether we're seeing a sort of bifurcated uh, read and not a clear one in terms of real-time activity. If you are just joining in, uh, we are seeing a decline in the equity market that's deepening after that retail sales surprise to the upside, down about uh, six-tenths of a percent for the S&P, 44.70. We're also discussing what the ramifications are with respect to China, given the fact that we heard from Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, that there was some implication uh, for the U.S. economy. Still with us is uh, Lindsay Piegza of Stiefel. Lindsay, what's your view on that? How interconnected are the two economies? Well, I think they're very interconnected. And certainly, we have to keep an eye on what's happening on the international stage as we see our, our one of our largest trading partners now suffer a significant weakness in terms of the economy. Now, will this necessarily translate into further deflationary pressures? It certainly could help alleviate or help compound some of the disinflationary pressures that we've been seeing on the producer side. But again, for the U.S. economy, and more importantly, for monetary policy, what we're struggling with is the demand side of the inflation equation. And that's what the Fed is going to be focused on. That's what their focus is in terms of containing inflation. Lindsay Piegza of Stiefel, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Janet Yellen speaking about the different programs that President Biden has put out there, but also saying that China's slowdown is a, quote, risk factor for the U.S. economy. Other people talking about some sort of decoupling and whether it's going to have an economic read-through, market read-through, what that's going to look like, how that's factored. 
entering into yields. Coming up, shifting gears a little bit, William Cohen joining us, author of Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World. After a bit of controversy over the CEO and growing dissent that is percolating into the news pages. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Solomon were to be fired today, I think the stock would actually go down. When I talk to investors, investors aren't saying, oh, get rid of David Solomon. They're really asking the questions you're asking. Hey, does the media impact their performance? Um, I'd say no so far. Having said that, David Solomon has to earn his job every day. And so I can come back in three months or six months and he doesn't get the job done. I'll be on the other side. That was Mike Mayo, Wells Fargo, head of U.S. large cap bank research at Wells Fargo, talking after a New York Magazine article titled, Is David Solomon Too Big a Jerk to Run Goldman Sachs? Inside a Banking uh, Mutiny. The discussion here, as people wonder what the path is forward, there have been a number of departures. Some people say it's within normal range. Some people saying that there's a real question mark at a time of tumult for the larger banking sector. Joining us now to discuss is Shanali Basik, Bloomberg Wall Street correspondent. Shanali, just to get started, what is the latest in terms of how Goldman is responding to this and how they're sort of setting it up, given clear internal dissent? This idea here that Mike Mayo had brought up, that performance has not been impacted. Listen, this year is a tough year for Goldman. The ROE has been the worst it's been in years. And we are splat dab today in the center of the third quarter. This is a pre pretty pivotal moment in terms of what Goldman would post at the end of this quarter. They have to finish their consumer strategy exits. They have green sky. They have a balance sheet reductions to get through. And so this idea about performance being impacted by a lot of the distractions happening at Goldman, this is when it's being put to test most. Why are people so fascinated with Goldman Sachs in particular? They're the biggest. <laughs> when it comes to the high-flying world of investment banking, Goldman Sachs has changed a lot. This was this uh, closely held partnership. And when David Solomon came in, part of the promise was to open this up, be sh more shareholder friendly. We are doing investor days now. But what happened was, with the personality traits that he has had, there has been a lot of friction between David versus the employees versus the media. And so that tension is now coming into the spotlight in a much bigger way, especially after the series of articles over the weekend. Now, the question is, are those those another set of just articles because we have seen kind of a lot of discontent over the years, uh, or is it something where the rubber hits the road and starts to impact Goldman's performance moving forward? And this year is a big year to really set that mark. Where is growth going to come from if it's not going to come from the consumer banking and if it's a time of difficulty for certainly getting deals done and other types of investment banking activities? A few things. They're putting their money on asset and wealth management. But here's a couple things about that business. That is where some of the balance sheet reduction is also happening now. So you saw things like a massive write down on real estate when they had to sell assets and really exit some positions and take some markdowns. You also see them still fighting pretty hard in trading. I will notice on a really um, positive note for Goldman, they have been beating Morgan Stanley in equities trading a couple quarters in a row there. So they have made strides. In mergers and acquisition, again, another pivotal year. For the first time in five years, they're still lagging behind JP Morgan on our own league tables. Uh, they are up in investment grade bond underwriting or high yield bond underwriting, but they're down in investment grade. So it's choppy, if, if you hear what I'm saying. And that's why this year is such a pivotal year for Goldman, because it's David Solomon's year to show whether this is just a lot of noise or whether it's impacting the core business lines that they're trying to prove are the future of the bank. As Mike Mayo said, his performance has held up until now. When that changes, perhaps his mind will change. But as of now, not so much. Nali Basik, thank you so much for being with us, someone who has written about Goldman Sachs and all of finance for many, many years. William Cohen, author of Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World, co-founder of Puck. Joining us now, William, I just want to start with what's your take on the article in New York Magazine, but more broadly, some of the articles percolating out that really challenge David Solomon's leadership? Well, the, the New York Magazine article, Lisa, was uh, particularly personal and pointed. Uh, you know, I, having written a book about uh, Goldman Sachs, I've read many, many, many articles 
uh, over the years about Goldman. And of course, Goldman is always a focal point of the media's attention. Uh, it's become uh, increasingly more of a focal point under David Solomon's leadership. Uh, in part, uh, honestly, because he is disengaged from the media, which is a strategy I don't really recommend uh, that he do, but, you know, he, he seems to be doing it. And I think some of the reason that you're getting these negative articles is because uh, he does not engage with the media, which, uh, you know, I think would he be better off doing. But the New York Magazine article in particular was very pointed, very personal, uh, very mean-spirited. and. Um, you know, obviously Goldman is pushing uh, back very hard against it, uh, almost like uh, makes the New York Times article, which came out the same day, uh, you know, uh, uh, an afterthought, even though it did contain that uh, bit of news that supposedly Lloyd Blankfein called up David Solomon, the previous CEO, and, and asked him if he could be helpful, that he had, quote, unquote, lost $50 million on his G, uh, Goldman Sachs stock and, you know, was willing to return if David would be willing to have him, which, of course, he said no. That said, at what point does the increase in bad publicity and these public concerns, public airing of grievances that might be percolating up in the internal ranks really create a, a challenge to running a firm, right? I mean, at what point does executive leadership have to have the room? Does he lose the room and still keep his job? Yeah, I mean, Sonali is right, and Mike Mayo is right. I mean, as, as long as the stock uh, holds up, which it has, basically, it's, uh, you know, it's off its 52-week highs, all-time highs, but it's basically held up uh, pretty well. Uh, you know, it's up to the board at this point. I mean, the board has been incredibly silent, which uh, is shocking to me. I think at some point, uh, you know, the board needs to come out in support of David Solomon. It, he's in a bit of a limbo now between the, all the complaining, uh, all the griping, and these negative media uh, articles. Uh, and it would be smart, I think, uh, for the board to come out in support of David if, in fact, they do support him. I mean, now he's in this kind of weird limbo. Uh, I, I know from my internal conversations with people at Goldman that the board uh, is not rattled by this. Uh, maybe that's uh, a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but they have not come out with any kind of public support which, frankly, would be smart to do. What is the response internally when you have some of these conversations? Is it surprise? Is it this was a long time coming? Is it agreement? What's the sort of feeling that you get? Uh, I think that um, you know, th there's some basic level of understanding that David has become a bit of a lightning rod and is a somewhat of a controversial uh, figure uh, and is sort of a hard driving, you know, CEO, uh, take no prisoners type, which frankly, uh, you know, is sort of what Goldman Sachs is all about. So on the one hand, I think they're very uh, supportive of David at the highest levels, as you would expect them to be. On the other hand, I think they understand that, um, especially because of the bonuses in 2022, the losses in the consumer sector that they're trying to put behind them. I mean, it's really all about uh, the bonuses that, that were down in 2022. But you need to really look at it over a two-year period. 21 was a huge year uh, for bonuses. 22, not so great. So you put them together, and people are still making an awful lot of money. Uh, but I would say that they are defensive and supportive. Uh, they know they're kind of in a battle, and that's why I say that the board should really put an end to this by coming out and, you know, either saying they support David or, or that they don't. William Cohen, thank you so much for being with us. William Cohen there, uh, author of a book on Goldman Sachs, longtime uh, financial correspondent and writer in many capacities. Right now, if you are just tuning in, we are seeing markets on the move following an upside surprise to retail sales coming in. The control group, which goes into GDP, up 1 percent versus the expected 0.5 percent. We've seen that decline pretty much hold at about uh, seven-tenths of a decline now, actually deepen for S&P futures. Yields higher. And and this has been what's been gaining everyone's attention. Ten-year yields, 4.23 percent real yields on the 10-year Treasury at the highest levels going back to 2009. We're also seeing right now the euro continue to gain against the dollar, which is sort of ironic considering some of the concerns over in China and this feeling that especially with better than expected data in the U.S., you should get the stronger dollar, the euro stronger, actually. Uh, now, 109.24 after briefly dropping below 
below the 109 handle. And we are seeing right now just more broadly this feeling that even if China does slow, you can see ongoing divergence. Oil prices, uh, which had climbed and stayed above $80 a barrel, still slightly lower on the heels of what we heard over in China. Coming up tomorrow on Bloomberg Surveillance, Nikolai Tangent, the Norges Bank Investment Management CEO on how to arrange in a world where Investing in the index could be fraught when there is this sort of feeling that perhaps uh, you can't divorce yourself from a sense of higher rates and slower growth. We also are looking forward to Target tomorrow and Walmart on Thursday, the latest read in consumers that seem to still have firepower. From New York, this is Bloomberg.